Well, good afternoon, everyone. In a view of time, um, I suggest that we get uh, started um, with the uh, uh, annual scientific meeting of the Netherlands Center for One Health. We still are expecting some people to log on. Log on. And um, in, I just got out of a, a meeting of WHO, uh, which uh, starts always with saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, to reflect the audience, which is global. And it's, it's a, a great pleasure to say that looking at the people uh, that signed up to our annual meeting, that also fits the picture. So we have people signing up from Indonesia to uh, North America and Canada which is uh, great to hear. And it's also clear that we will uh, uh, make it possible to uh, uh, look back at this whole meeting uh, later online. So I am going to uh, start with a brief uh, introduction. Uh, first of myself, I'm the, uh, uh, Marion Koopmans. I'm uh, head of virus science at Erasmus Medical Center and I'm the director emerging infectious diseases of the Netherlands Center for One Health, uh, which uh, is uh, the host of this meeting. And I am chairing this session uh, this, this afternoon together with uh, Heimann Wertheim. So the Netherlands Center for One Health was launched um, uh, several years ago, five, five years almost, um, and building from, I'm sorry, there's animation in here that, um, building from the notion that we are a very uh, densely populated uh, country, not only with uh, 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 people, but also with animals and with ambition for biodiversity and wildlife. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, um, a lot of expertise in the country uh, in different universities and the Netherlands Center for One Health was an initiative to uh, join forces and start looking at uh, disease problems in a One Health perspective. So this is what that looks like. So we have the central dogma of uh, One Health, which means that the health of humans, uh, animals, not livestock and, and wildlife and ecosystems are interconnected and need to be studied in connection. And we do that along four main themes. One is antimicrobial resistance. One is emerging infectious diseases. One is healthy wildlife and ecosystems. And one is smart and healthy farming. So in our network, we have uh, expertise, uh, notably on human and uh, animal medicine, veterinary medicine, environmental uh, uh, expert uh, sciences, uh, ecology, microbiology, virology, and so on. And we have uh, worked uh, along these themes um, written down in a strategic research agenda that was uh, initiated uh, uh, five years ago, close to five years ago. So where are we at? Uh, we are right now, I think we can say a uh, vibrant, <laughs> Uh, organization, if that's what you can call, collaborative effort. Uh, we have uh, over the years launched um, PhD programs uh, along these three main themes. One is studying the complexity of the system that we talk about, the, uh, the uh, connectedness between humans, animals, and the environment. Uh, a theme, disease intervention strategies, and a theme specifically focusing on vector-borne diseases. And uh, with the evolving uh, projects, we now have uh, over 65 PhD students uh, involved in the Netherlands Center for One Health. So where does all that come from? Well, we started with a, a strategic investment from the participating uh, institutes in blue, but since then several additional uh, funds were, were acquired uh, at the national level and at the international level. Um, 
So this is the slide that I showed at the launch. Uh, so it, at that point, we still were very much an idea, but right now I think we can say that the NCOH has, uh, has uh, come to fruition and this is uh, aiming for the moon as we speak. So with that, so as you can tell, there's an animation in this slide set that I did not put in there. <laughs> um, but um, uh, with that, I will hand over to uh, my co-chair, uh, Professor Heiman Wertheim from Radboud University. Uh, and he will uh, also welcome you uh, briefly. Heiman, you want to yep. share the slides? Yeah, thank you. If you can move to the next slide, please, Marion. So thanks, Marion, for introducing me. Yeah. So welcome to you all, indeed 300 participants from over the 12 countries from Asia all the way up to North America, which is wonderful to see. That is indeed a organization, uh, the Netherlands Center for One Health. So the focus is um, uh, on One Health in the Netherlands, but of course this concerns us all worldwide. And the organizer, when we thought about organizing, organizing this meeting, we thought, well, it started small somewhere probably in China with the wildlife market. Please go back, yeah, thank you. And in the end, it had consequences for everybody. Uh, and in the end, also huge economical consequences. And uh, we really want to look forward in a multidisciplinary fashion and really also have a discussion at the end, what are the lessons for the Netherlands Center for One Health? And what do we need to do different? So we have a great sort of lineup of speakers. Next slide, uh, please. Uh, really sort of spanning from basic virology to modeling to public health, behavior sciences and economy. In between, we have a break. And I think there will be a surprise in this break where everybody who was actually in the Netherlands had something like this, which we'll need during the break. So we're really, really looking forward to that uh, surprise. Um, but uh, we really want to start now first with the first speaker, which is uh, Professor Thijs uh, Kuiken. And Professor Thijs Kuiken is a professor of comparative pathology at the Department of Virus Sciences at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. The current focus of his research is the pathogenesis of respiratory virus infections such as influenza and COVID-19 in humans and the characterization of emerging viral diseases at the wildlife and human interface. So very appropriate for this meeting. And he will discuss uh, wildlife markets. Can they stay open? I don't think the answer will be very uh, clear and probably not a clear yes or no, but maybe there will be a yes or no. So Thijs, the floor is all yours. The Zoom is all yours. We really look forward to your talk. Thank you. So thanks very much for the introduction. So we start uh, today's presentations about COVID-19 pandemic with a rather suggestive question. Wildlife markets, can they stay open? And I will answer this question, I promise, but not before giving the larger context about wildlife trade, emerging zoonoses and biodiversity. So just to remind you that the direct reason for this question is that uh, the emergence of COVID-19 in December 2019 was linked to the wildlife market in Wuhan, China, because the majority of the first human cases had a link to this market. And the causative coronavirus is most similar to a coronavirus found in bats. And the most likely scenario is that this virus spilled over into humans, either directly from bats or from an intermediate animal species. So just to give you a little bit more detail about this, based on phylogenetic analysis of coronaviruses from human cases, so shown here, and from other animal species, the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, was most closely related to viruses that were sampled either from horseshoe bats or from Malayan pangolins confiscated due to uh, illegal wildlife trade in southern China. However, based on full genome sequencing, it showed that the SARS-CoV-2 virus was more likely originated from horseshoe bats than from Malayan pangolins. This does suggest, however, that wildlife trade was involved in the emergence of COVID-19. So what is wildlife trade, actually? The definition of wildlife trade is the commerce of products that are derived from non-domesticated animals or plants 
usually extracted from their natural environment or raised under controlled conditions. And in this presentation, I'll concentrate mostly on trade of wild animals. So the reasons for trade can be various, including food, fur, fashion. The trade can be either within a country or internationally. Trade can be legal, but there is also a lot of illegal trade. And um, the trade can be sustainable. That is the, the um, wildlife populations involved are maintained or it can be unsustainable. So as indicated in the definition, wildlife trade also includes wild animals raised under controlled conditions, that is farmed. And wildlife farming is an important industry in many countries. For example, in China, there were 14 million people employed in wildlife farming and related businesses in 2016. But also in Europe, wildlife farming is important. You see here a Danish farm for mink that is being raised for their fur. And every year in Denmark, about 1,500 mink farms raise about 19 million mink. And it's their third largest agricultural export product. So it really is a big and global industry. So using data from the United Nations trade database, international legal wildlife trade has increased more than fivefold in value in the last 14 years and in 2019 was estimated at 107 billion US dollars. And this fivefold increase is really remarkable given that the, the total value of global goods and services measured by GDP only increased about 1.7 fold in that same time period. So besides legal wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade is also an important activity and is considered to be worth about 25% of legal trade or about up to 23 billion US dollars per year. And this figure shows the air trafficking routes for illegal wildlife trade between 2016 and 2018 that were discovered and reported by customs officials and again, it shows that wildlife trade is not limited to one country or one region, but occurs worldwide. And together, this indicates that wildlife trade is a global commercial activity that's rapidly expanding, provides employment to many people, and represents a high monetary value. So besides these uh, positive aspects, there are also significant negative aspects to wildlife trade. And I'll discuss um, two um, of these. The first negative aspect of wildlife trade is that it is an underlying cause for the emergence of zoonoses. There are several factors involved in this. More intimate uh, contact among wildlife, livestock and humans facilitates spillover, amplification and spread of novel pathogens, increased numbers and density of farmed animals, wild or domestic, allow infections to spread more easily and drive bigger outbreaks, and increased volume of trade and efficiency of long distance transport along the wildlife trade chain drives the movement of pathogens across large distances and allows them to contact populations that may have not been infected before. Examples of such zoonoses that have led to either epidemics or pandemics in people are Ebola and AIDS emerged due to hunting of wildlife in Central and West Africa for food. Monkeypox emerged due to trade of exotic wild rodents in the USA. And SARS and COVID-19 emerged due to wildlife trade in China. So despite the risk of zoonosis emergence from wildlife trade, the regulations for monitoring pathogens in traded wildlife are really lacking in many aspects. And I'll just name two of these. First, as illustrated by a study in the United States, it was shown that even though it's mandatory to record the species of wildlife imported into a country, uh, only about 14% of live wild animal shipments in this study were identified to species. And the majority of shipments were identified only to class I, for example, birds, or were not identified at all. So how can you monitor pathogens properly 
if you don't even know which species you're dealing with. And secondly, the monitoring of pathogen of wildlife is not really claimed well by any government agency. Wildlife or environmental departments concentrate on wildlife conservation, regulated, for example, by the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species, while agricultural departments concentrate on preventing disease incursions by domestic animals, as regulated by the OIE. So pathogen surveillance of traded wildlife falls in between the cracks. Oh. So um, after its risk for zoonosis emergence, a second negative aspect of wildlife trade is that it is a driver for species extinction. And before going further about this, I have a question for you, which you can answer via your computer. Which percentage of terrestrial wild birds, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles, together they form about 31,500 species, do you think is traded globally? Do you think it's 1% uh, of these species, 10% of these species, or 25% of these species? So I'll give you a moment to answer this question. So here's the poll result so far. In the lead is a uh, 10%. Most people thought that 10% are traded globally. A smaller number thought that 25% were traded globally, and the smallest number of participants indicated that 1% were traded globally. So I'll close this now and continue. The answer is 24%. Uh, 7,600 species of terrestrial mammals, birds and reptiles and amphibians being traded globally. So really a very, very large percentage of, uh, of uh, wild vertebrate species. And in a recent global analysis that used data from both CITES and the IUCN, the correlation was determined between wildlife trade in a species and its threat status um, from uh, least concern as you can see here in the graph, LC, to critically endangered CR in the figure. And in the figure, you can see that the percentage of animal species in each threat status that is traded in red versus none traded in blue shows that, especially for wild birds and wild mammals, the percentage of traded species is higher and are in higher categories of threat indicating that trade indeed is a risk factor for species extinction. So together with other human activities like deforestation, human society really has a big impact on wildlife populations, both in terms of population decline and species extinction. And in that context, I have a second and last question in my talk for you. Which percentage of the global biomass of mammals that is wildlife, livestock, and humans is wild. And by global biomass, I mean the current cumulative body weight of all wild mammals in the world, both terrestrial ones like wildebeest and elephants and marine mammals like striped dolphins and blue whales. Is it 5%, 25% or 75% that's represented by wild animals? So I'm waiting for the answer here. You're thinking, you're thinking. Here are the results. So the majority of you think that um, it's represented by that the global biomass of wild mammals is 5% uh, 
and smaller percentages think that it's uh, 25 percent or 75 percent. So no clear answer, but a slight majority for five percent. And indeed, you are right. The answer is less than five percent, four percent to be precise. So in this graph on the left, you can see that before there were any humans around, um, 100,000 years before the present, um, the total biomass of wild mammals was estimated at around 0.04 gigaton of uh, carbon, which is the measure used to measure biomass. And largely as a result of human activities, this has decreased about sixfold to the present day. And despite this, um, the global biomass of mammals as a whole has increased about fourfold in that period due to the biomass of livestock and the biomass of humans. And this is shown very nicely in the right graph. And these data show very clearly the radical ecological effects that human civilization has had for life on Earth. So you might ask, perhaps this effect happened in the past. But now we're actually looking after wild animal species that are still left very carefully. And to assess that current state of biodiversity and also ecosystem services provided by nature, the IPES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services last year published a global assessment report on this subject. And you, you can read the policy summary of the report in this uh, URL. And their report included an assessment of the rate of extinction of vertebrate classes, birds, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and fishes in the last 500 years. And this graph shows that the current rate of species extinction in these species is tens to hundreds times higher than background extinction and is accelerating at the current time. So actually, instead of better protecting wildlife, we're actually doing the opposite. And based on these assessments, it best reached a number of conclusions which were approved by the 135 governments participating in this UN agency, including most EU countries. And two key conclusions were that they indicated that um, by current business as usual, it wasn't possible to reach sustainability, but that could only be done by transformative changes, namely a fundamental system-wide change across technological, economic, and social factors. And a part of uh, building a global sustainable economy was steering away from the current limited paradigm of economic growth, which I think is very relevant for this uh, afternoon's sessions. So more recently, in July of this year, IPES convened a workshop on biodiversity and pandemics in which I participated. And this workshop brought together 22 experts from all regions of the world to discuss how pandemics emerge from microbial, microbial diversity, the role of land use change, climate change and wildlife trade in driving pandemics and providing options to control and prevent future pandemics based on a One Health approach. And by chance, um, the presentation of this uh, workshop report is uh, happening this afternoon at 3 p.m. So these are the policy options to reduce pandemic risk from the current situation of wildlife trade coming from this workshop. And they include um, to establish intergovernmental partnership for health monitoring um, with collaboration of OIE, CITES and other organizations to reduce or stop trade in high risk species, especially mammals and birds, and to enhance law enforcement of illegal trade. And in this workshop, there were also policy options that were more general, not specifically related to wildlife trade. And these uh, included uh, to label high risk consumption items such as uh, fur on the, uh, on the uh, edge of the coat coming from uh, farmed wildlife, um, to incentivize alternatives, um, to increase the sustainability of agriculture, 
And um, this is something that probably will please some of you um, to support One Health scientific research for prevention of pandemics. So coming back to the original question, wildlife markets, can they stay open? My answer is no, they cannot, not li like they are now. And we need changes in wildlife markets and wildlife trade to lower the zoonotic risk. And more in general, we need to fundamentally change our attitude towards wild animals and nature in general. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, uh, guys. Wonderful uh, overview and also a clear answer to uh, the question. Probably you've seen the, the movie of David Attenborough, the biologist. I didn't, I didn't see it. My mother did, but I didn't, no. Ah. Yeah. So he also, yeah. he says, uh, you should really real value sort of the wild and, and, and restore it as much as you can. And actually there's an unimaginable value. And, and now the value is really by logging, et cetera, uh, taking out the wood that has economical value and keeping it sort of intact doesn't have any sort of monetary value. So what do you think is a solution for that? Is that something that's feasible in your eyes to really revalue that as a... So I think this is a, a, a key change that we as a human society need to do is that we shouldn't limit ourselves so much uh, to the, the um, uh, narrow monetary value of uh, nature and uh, we shouldn't um, consider nature as being a, a, a source of our resources to be taken um, um, as, as we please, but realize that we are actually part of nature and that um, it's important for our own well-being and our welfare um, to take care of um, um, other parts of nature than just um, the human species. And this is important not only for this subject, but for many other subjects, including uh, um, climate change um, and, and uh, food security. Uh, I think it's really important that we make this fundamental change in the way that human society thinks. Yeah, I fully agree. So one question from uh, the audience, how can we stop illegal trade in smaller species as they are so easy to hide? Any thoughts on that? Um, I don't have any specific uh, uh, thoughts on that, on how to 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 do that. No, um, I think that um, if you look uh, the way that we um, think about wildlife, uh, the the legality and Ill illegality of wildlife trade is is uh, considered much lower than other um, crimes. But actually, if you uh, give more value to um, wildlife and more value to nature, I think that um, uh, carrying out crimes against nature also um, comes with, with higher um, punishments and um, is, is given more um, funding to actually um, carry out uh, uh, consistent and well-informed um, controls that at the moment are, are really lacking. I mean, at the moment, uh, it's, it's actually quite easy to illegally import um, animals um, through uh, into, into countries because there's very, very little actual um, checking of that and relatively little expertise in that. Okay. Well, thank you. And uh, we're going to move on to the, the next speaker. Actually, we have this part is actually about uncertainty, which contains two speakers. And uh, Bart Haagman, he will share more insights about how to be uh, to listen better to signals to be better prepared. And Corinne Ten Bos will share her lessons learned from working with uncertainty. And the first speaker is uh, Bart Haagman. He's a leading uh, scientist at the Department of Virus Science at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. And his main interest is the pathogenesis of emerging viral infections, including SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. Virus tropism, receptor usage, and zoonotic transmission are studied with the aim to further understand the biology of coronaviruses and to develop candidate vaccines. So we're going to listen to the early signals for better preparedness from Bart Hagmans. Well, Bart, you, the floor is yours. Thank you. So hopefully the, the slides show up now. Uh, yes. It's okay. Okay. 
So indeed, I'll focus on, on early signals and better preparedness. Uh, I'll take a few examples of other coronaviruses that jump the species barrier. And of course, the, the, the first example is, is, is SARS-CoV-1, I would say, the, uh, the virus that uh, emerged in 2002 and then in 2003 caused uh, an outbreak in China. Uh, and, and this one actually was noticed quite late, so that uh, WHO was alerted in March, whereas the outbreak already started much earlier. So the earlier signs actually <clears throat> were noted in, in China. It's interesting to, to say that uh, the, the outbreak in southern China then uh, was notified by the Chinese, and actually they uh, identified uh, the, the causative agent as a coronavirus, and actually the guy who did that was fired. So uh, although they knew that there was an outbreak on uh, with a new coronavirus, this was not noticed, and it took quite some time. So before <clears throat> the uh, WHO was alerted and the, the virus was identified, uh, looking back and retrospectively, it's clear that already earlier 2003 and uh, late 2002, there were a uh, few cases noted in, 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 in China. And these outbreaks actually were related to uh, zoonotic transmission, at least that was the, uh, the idea. And that could be then demonstrated by uh, uh, Yi Guan later on in 2003 showing that actually in this case, the, uh, the, <coughs> the virus originated from, from uh, uh, palm civet cats, and that was shown by both by serology and by PCR, but not only those animals. So it also showed that, that uh, raccoon dogs, for example, also could be a potential reservoir. Interesting to know that recently, Martin Beer also showed that these raccoon dogs are also susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, pointing to a similar a potential intermediate host also in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, outbreak or susceptible species similar as, uh, for example, mink. Um, the point is, is that <clears throat> this then alerted and, and led to a, a better preparedness in that uh, there was knowledge on the potential uh, intermediate host. Later on, <clears throat> this was followed up by studies in bats. And it was quite a surprise at that point that that the diversity of coronaviruses in bats was that uh, uh, huge. And we now know that SARS-related viruses are uh, a, a big family of, of uh, variants that are present in, in bats, not only for the SARS-2 viruses, but also uh, viruses like MERS have viruses that are uh, quite diverse and occur in different uh, bat species. Um, I should say that the, the, the virus that's mostly related to SARS actually uh, um, was discovered much later. So it took 10 years for uh, the Wuhan group to show that the virus embeds in, in Western China actually is most likely the virus that uh, was the start of the outbreak in, in 2002. So it may take quite some time to find uh, these uh, related viruses in, in their natural host. But I think at that point in 2003, the, the indication that, that civet cats uh, were a potential threat uh, was one of the um, um, ideas to follow up. And I think was important then also to further contain. So for better preparedness at the short term, uh, that was important. Um, these viruses in, 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 in civet cats actually, and that's shown here, uh, need to adapt. So it is important to know that not necessarily these viruses can <clears throat> jump directly to humans and cause um, 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 an outbreak and are transmissible uh, um, that well. So we have seen that <clears throat> there's a huge diversity in the uh, viruses, especially in the spike protein. So the virus protein that interacts with the receptor in that the uh, changes are needed to adapt to the, to the human host and that the early uh, palm civet isolates are uh, much different from the early, late isolates that indicated here that caused the, the, the pandemic outbreak. And there's also associated, associated with differences in outcomes. So if you would do an experiment, for example, in non-human primates, it has been done by Barry Rocks, also works now here at Erasmus. But when he was in the States, he showed that 
these kind of viruses are uh, cause uh, limited disease in non human primates, whereas the later stage viruses have adapted to the receptor and then cause more severe disease. But the knowledge on, on, on these viruses being present in, in, <coughs> in civet cats was important because late 2003, early 2004, there were uh, four cases identified in China actually that uh, were related to the spillover again of a SARS-related virus uh, from civet cats showing that the knowledge that was gained um, uh, was now uh, instrumental in containing this outbreak. And at that point, uh, uh, the decision was made to, uh, to kill uh, the civet cat. So at that point, uh, there was no <coughs> trading anymore of, of civet cats in the wet markets in southern China. So um, this was important in further uh, uh, limiting uh, this virus uh, spreading from, from the intermediate host. And the idea was that uh, <clears throat> this virus was gone, and, uh, but of course, there was still uh, a lot of concerns that related viruses, uh, SARS-related viruses in bats, uh, could germ the species barrier. And that has been shown now in the uh, 2020 outbreak of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is one example, and the other example is actually uh, a virus that emerged in, in, in the Middle East, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. This is a bit different in that the viruses uh, are uh, present in the intermediate host, the dromedary camel, and in this case, they don't need to adapt that much. So viruses <coughs> can uh, spill over to humans uh, at, uh, at, uh, during uh, different periods. So we have seen uh, multiple outbreaks and it's uh, 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 still ongoing. But the point is that the early signal in this case actually was a bit different. So the, the outbreak was not ongoing, but there was a single case uh, uh, reported uh, by, in this case, by, uh, by Ali Zaki from Saudi Arabia and the virus was characterized in in Rotterdam, but the point is that it is quite different from the SARS outbreak in that in uh, 2012, this virus was recognized and characterized. Interestingly, <clears throat> this was not the first uh, early sign, I would say. There was an early sign earlier that year in 2012, an outbreak in Jordan. Actually, that one was a, a, a a case, a cluster of, of unknown pneumonia cases. That is quite often what you want to investigate. In that case, also WHO investigated that outbreak, but could not identify this novel coronavirus. So it is quite unusual here that um, uh, Alizaki uh, identified from one single case a novel coronavirus, um, and, but um, from that point on, we have seen multiple outbreaks, um, especially in the Middle East. And these outbreaks are uh, fed by the uh, spillover from, from, from dromedary camels. Um, it's interesting to say that now we know that this is the intermediate host, so that could lead to a better preparedness. But looking back, it, it's interesting to know that uh, the presence of this virus is not restricted only to the Middle East, but dromedary camels in, in, in Africa uh, also are seropositive for, for this virus, and the virus can also be isolated from the dromedary camels in Africa. Not only that, if you look here in the red box, it indicated going back to the uh, 90s of the last century is that already at that point, uh, this virus seems to be present in, in, in dromedary camels. I would say indicating that early signals in that case have not been notified. So if we would have done uh, a further analysis on uh, viruses being present in animal species that have the potential to jump, uh, we would have uh, probably uh, notified these uh, early on. And of course now a lot of research is focusing on these efforts to uh, characterize virus with, with potential and potentially these kind of viruses then would be also picked up. So what, what can we do with this knowledge? What, 
is the, the better preparedness knowing <clears throat> that the virus is present in, in the dromedary camels. Um, uh, one option in this case is, is that you would develop vaccines to reduce transmission from these uh, viruses, potential uh, zoonotic uh, transmission. And that's, for example, what we did. So we developed a vaccine uh, to uh, reduce shedding of the virus uh, and, and in that also reduce the, uh, the, <clears throat> the, the risk of transmission to humans. So that was the second example. And I think a third example is quite interesting going back to China and that is in 2017. In that, <clears throat> in that case, in, in swine, an outbreak was noted in a few farms uh, and that virus that was isolated uh, from these pigs actually was related to a bad uh, coronavirus, the, the HQ2, uh, and caused multiple outbreaks. The Chinese in that case were quite uh, quick on the ball and they uh, killed all these uh, pigs. And I think there's no indication that this virus now has spread or is still present in the population. So. By doing so, I think they prevented the, the further spread of this virus, knowing that like the SARS virus in 2003, these viruses could be potentially spread also to humans. <clears throat> this was not known for sure for quite some time. And interestingly, I think last week, uh, the, 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 the group of uh, Ralph Barrick in the US reported that uh, this virus actually can also infect uh, human cells, so primary cells, primary uh, respiratory cells can be infected by, by this virus, indicating zoonotic uh, potential. So looking back at, at this outbreak of a virus from bats that uh, uh, caused an outbreak in pigs, I think was uh, successfully uh, uh, stopped by the Chinese. So this is a bit different now with SARS-CoV-2, where we have seen <clears throat> a huge outbreak. Uh, and of course, the question is what Thais also indicated is where is this virus is coming from? Is it the pangolins or it's probably more likely bats, again bats. And the question still is, is there an intermediate host? So we have seen for, for, for the SARS-1 and MERS and also for the SARS virus, the, 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 the other enteric coronavirus, that clearly there's a role for intermediate hosts. For SARS-CoV-2, that, that's less clear. And <clears throat> I think it's interesting if we look at, at other coronaviruses uh, that have emerged, not only the, 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 the recent ones, but also, for example, uh, NL63 and, and 229E, which are the common cold viruses, they also originate uh, from, from bats. So then going back to SARS-1, I, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I said that the civet cats are an intermediate host, but uh, from phylogenetic analysis at that point, it may be a bit more complicated in that <clears throat> the SARS viruses in bats uh, actually also could uh, directly uh, cause an outbreak in humans that then spill back to, to civet cats and are indications for, for this scenario. And this has been further uh, fueled by more recent studies, uh, again, by uh, collaboration between the Wuhan uh, lab from uh, Sheng Li Shi and, and, and Ralph Barrick, showing that, that viruses related <coughs> to the SARS-CoV virus that caused the outbreak in 2003, uh, so these are all bad coronaviruses, actually, <coughs> when uh, synthesized uh, synthetically so making an infectious clone based on the sequence that was identified. So uh, and then checking for uh, replication in vitro, and that's shown here, shows that uh, similar to the SARS uh, virus from 2003, this virus also replicates efficiently in human cells, indicating that uh, it's not only uh, the SARS-CoV-1 virus at that point, but multiple var multiple different viruses in this cluster that they have the potential to, to, to spread to humans. And in this case, also probably directly uh, to humans. So this could be also applied to the SARS-2. And of course, the question is where this virus is coming from. But clearly, um, it could be that we 
I have to look more carefully also to, to bets and, and the sequences and how what do the sequences tell us of pandem pandemic potential of these viruses being present in, in bats. Moving to, to, to SARS-2, this information on, on the diversity of, of SARS uh, coronaviruses in this cluster of bat-related virus was, was <clears throat> instrumental in the early days as uh, Christian Drosten actually uh, based on uh, early reports in uh, from China indicating that there was a SARS-like virus potentially that caused the outbreak. He made a, a diagnostic test, a PCR, that actually is based on these sequences. So the early test and the one that is now used uh, also in the Netherlands, which is based on the e-gene uh, test, is actually um, based on the different sequences from this cluster of uh, bad SARS viruses. So it not only detects SARS-2, but it also detects the other uh, SARS virus. So this is clearly uh, using the information of, of viruses being present in bats and applying that to diagnostics for future outbreaks, not only in humans, but also potentially in intermediate hosts. Um, for the outbreaks in humans, we don't only need for better preparedness diagnostics, including uh, the, the, the molecular tools and the serological tools, but we could think also of using the knowledge on the diversity uh, of the SARS-related virus to develop and, uh, intervention strategies. And one of these would be, for example, monoclonal antibodies. And interestingly, uh, Benjamin Bosch, uh, together with uh, Frank Kostel and, and our group, identified a monoclonal antibody uh, that is reactive not only against SARS-CoV-2, but also against SARS-CoV-1. So this one is cross-reactive against different uh, uh, isolates uh, that the different viruses in this cluster of SARS-related virus, which could be of interest not only for this outbreak, but also for future outbreaks. And maybe this is one of the leads that also then can be further developed on cross-reactive uh, uh, vaccines that could be used in future outbreaks. So clearly, how can we use these early signs of, of outbreaks for, for better preparedness in the future? And that's what I wanted to close with, is that as I've shown that, that from these bats and the, the information we get from, from, from viruses isolated and detected in bats, uh, we can develop diagnostic tools. Uh, this can be based on, uh, on PCR tests, like the test developed by Christian Drosten to detect the, uh, the, the, the SARS-2 uh, virus, but also a serological test that could be instrumental to, to early detect and better prepared for, for a virus that jumped a species barrier. For the intermediate host, <clears throat> blocking the zoonotic transmission would be an option, uh, apart from culling, I mean, for the civet cats and the pigs, you could uh, apply culling, uh, but for other options, I mean, like what I indicated for the uh, dromedary camels, potentially development of vaccines uh, could be an option, as is also used for, for example, for influenza. Uh, last but not least, uh, this uh, better preparedness could extend to the development of cross-protective antivirals and monoclonals. Uh, and vaccines uh, to be better protect, uh, prepared for uh, future outbreaks. And with that, I close and give the word back to the to Yeah, Thank you, uh, Bart Hagemans, for a wonderful overview. I have one question for you. So I think Peter Daszak and his group, the EcoHealth Alliance, were already doing a lot of surveillance on coronavirus as well as in bats in the Wuhan uh, region. Were there any <coughs> signs or really early signals from their work that really would have predicted what we're in now? Yeah, uh, but, but I indicated the, 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 the virus that was generated uh, as an infectious clone from sequences that were known, the work from Ralph Berg and uh, Sheng Li Shi, I think already indicated that, that not only the, the SARS-1 virus is, is of danger, but many of these related viruses have the potential to jump and uh, can infect uh, human cells directly. So clearly there is a, a diversity of viruses present that can jump. 
Yeah. What would what would have been the con what should have been the consequence if you would uh, if we would have known yeah. kill the bats or uh, and that, so that 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 would be I mean you would need to, to get better knowledge now on on which of these viruses have the potential to germ so that if you detect them you really need to know that you need to come into action uh, but it indeed it is, it is quite complicated so once they they, they germ you still need to have other measures to to to, to curtail the, the, the outbreaks. Okay, so I think there's one question uh, from Lineke. Listening to the early science, are you of the opinion that our interactions between humans, domestic animals, and free-ranging animals should be changed to stop these viruses from emerging? Sort of also links actually to the first speaker. Uh, are you opinion that the interaction with the humans? No, yeah, that, I, I think yeah, I agree with 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 Thais, especially looking at, at China, because it's not a coincidence that that many of these outbreaks, not only SARS one, SARS two, but also as I indicated, SARS, all emerged in, in in China and are related to 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 the to these kind of activities. So clearly, we need to change uh, our attitude here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move to uh, the next speaker. Uh, so this is going to be Queen Ten Bos. She's an assistant professor in infectious disease epidemiology at Wageningen University. And currently she's a one of the lead modelers in the One Health Pact, examining the emergence of mosquito-borne diseases in the Netherlands, but she's also involved in several SARS-CoV-2 response efforts. And now Queen will delve into how modeling can help in the interpretation of complex, imperfect epidemic data, particularly at the early stages of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So, Corinne, the floor or the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Uh, you have to unmute. We don't, we don't hear you yet. Is it possible for someone to unmute? Sometimes it doesn't work with the headphones. Try that. I sh can you hear me now? Yes, we can now hear you. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you for that kind introduction and for inviting me uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this talk. Um, so, um, as Heimann said, my name is Quirin Ten Bos and I'm an assistant professor at Wageningen University at the group of uh, quantitative veterinary epidemiology. And today we're doing a bit of a, a throwback first day, going back to the early days of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and see what the role of modelers and epidemiologists was at that time to learn as fast as possible from imperfect epidemic data. So if we go back to that time, um, Green, your slides yeah. are showing. I'm, you guys are all looking at me. That's also nice. No problem. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> How about this? What? That looks. We see the road now. It's a it's a dark road. Hello. That's that's exactly what we're what we're going down okay. Go ahead. okay so we are back in uh 2020 uh, early 2020 and uh the, the epidemic starts unfolding and we're, we're largely in the dark about what's going to happen what, what sort of threat we're facing and uh as as the threat is unfolding, also there's uh, there's increasing amounts of data uh, coming to to help us um, unravel the pieces of the puzzle that uh, are so pertinent at that point in time to to um, to mitigate or to do the to do the best we can to mitigate this epidemic. Um, so in this talk, I'll I'll try to uh, to talk a little bit about the role of, of modelers and epidemiologists in in dealing with these these imperfect data and and putting these pieces of the puzzle together. Um, yeah. Um, so let's think about what these pieces of the puzzle are first. So um, I have a, a few poll questions, Mike, if you want to, to pull up the first one, just to get a handle of how uh, every piece of the puzzle is insightful, but maybe not so much on its own. Uh, so the first question, a virus with an R a reproduction number of 1.5 is easier to control than one that has a reproduction number of two. So for 
so so if 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 two people infect only three other people versus four, is that yes, true, no, not true, or C, it depends. Oh, I saw it briefly, but I think there was lots of it depends there. So um, let's move on to the next question. A virus with an infection fatality rate of 50% is more important to control than one with an infection fatality rate of only 0.1%. So a virus that's killing half of the people it infects versus one that only kills one in a thousand. Is that yes, A, yes, no, uh, B, no, or C, it depends. It depends. Okay, let's see what's coming up for the last question. A virus with a high symptomatic ratio is more important to control than one with a high ratio of asymptomatic infections. Again, yes, no, or it depends. So let's see if we are finding even more consensus in these uh, questions. It depends, there's some no's. Okay. So the right answer to each of these questions probably indeed is it depends. And uh, why this is, is because uh, for each of these viruses, it also depends on how widespread they're going to be, how many people they're going to infect. So the public health impact or the impact for human health um, ultimately is um, um, a numbers game. And, and that's the challenge that public health uh, um, um, specialists are facing every time uh, playing the, goal, the, game, uh, the rules of this number game. So in this talk, um, <coughs> I would like to, to, uh, to talk a little bit about what these rules are, what factors determine uh, how we should play by the rules of, of outbreak control, uh, give a few of intuitive examples uh, from early on during the outbreak of, uh, of how we learned to, to, to play the game. And, and lastly, I'll, I'll give a bit of a case study, uh, a modeling case study, how uh, public health was informed by, by these pieces of the puzzle. Um, so, <coughs> let's first think of, of outbreak controllability. If we go back to, to January 2020, um, it was quite uh, uh, evident quite soon that we were really facing a threat of a virus that was able to cause la uh, large uh, morbidity, uh, numbers of fatalities, and even overwhelm um, healthcare systems. So with that, it was evident that we needed to uh, to make uh, to 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 control this virus. But how? Um, so after the uh, SARS um, one outbreak, uh, Christoph Fraser wrote this 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 quite nice paper laying out what the fundamentals of the controllability of an outbreak are. And and if we look at the Dutch uh, the Dutch example, probably um, I, I think it's quite intuitive. So it's strength, speed, and vision. So strength is how how um, how big of a hammer do we need? How big is the, the, how stringent is the lockdown that we need to do, for instance? Speed, when should we start this? How fast do we have to act? And vision, can we, um, can we track the virus well enough to know when to react and also where? <coughs> So easier said than done, but let's 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 maybe start with the hammer. So the hammer all comes down to the reproduction number. So we've learned about this from um, uh, Jaap van Dissel and others uh, uh, recently for for the Dutch people in the audience. So the average number of new infections caused by an infected individual, and and this number determines. Um, 
the size of the hammer that we need. Namely, it determines how many of these uh, contacts we need to, to reduce to become at an R of, of one or preferably lower than one so that the outbreak uh, uh, stops um, uh, increasing. So we can do this in multiple ways, uh, for instance, by making sure that the time that you as an infected person can infect other people is as short as possible by isolating yourself when you, you get symptoms, um, by reducing your number of contacts, even if you don't have symptoms, uh, by when you have a contact with someone, make sure that the chance that you infect that person is as low as possible by physical distancing, wearing masks, um, not singing, for instance, which is uh, for some people uh, a good uh, idea anyway. And as a susceptible person, uh, 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 similarly, um, how do you reduce your susceptibility to an infected individual by keeping that distance, by washing your hands, um, and, and, and ultimately, uh, and hopefully soon, by, by, uh, by being vaccinated? Um, so if we just look at this figure, it, it looks quite easy actually to estimate R0 or the reproduction number. It's just a matter of uh, counting the number of infections that every infected person counts, uh, creates, and then just taking the average of that. Um, so that makes our life very easy, um, if only. I say this a bit jokingly, but of course there are, or of course there are indeed infections where contacts, infection contacts are a bit more countable than others. For instance, uh, sexually transmitted diseases or injecting drug users. Uh, those those contacts are are easier to trace. Um, here on the left, we see an example early on in the Ebola virus epidemic, uh, where uh, Ebola for it to transmit needs quite um, quite close contacts. So they were actually able by doing active contact tracing to to track this uh, um, <coughs> to nicely track this 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 early these early clusters and actually work out um, the, the reproduction number at different settings so this was in at funerals versus healthcare setting, settings etc and they could even see that it changed uh, in response to to outbreak measures Unfortunately for respiratory viruses, this is a bit harder, uh, but we see on the right a nice example where uh, we can at least do an effort, right? So this is also early work during the pandemic where we were still uh, um, uh, grasping for, for, for answers. We still are, but especially just think back of, of the situation we were in then. Um, so this is a, a, a very nice data set of clusters of cases in Singapore. And what was nice about that is that, um, well, you can, you can see a little bit. So there's lots of edges there. So sometimes they know they can make the pairs of infectors and infectees. But what was also nice was that they, they, they could sort of distinguish clusters of cases. Um, <coughs> So we don't have the direct pairs and we don't have life. Life isn't as easy as with, with Ebola or a sexually transmitted disease, but we have the size of these clusters. Um, and we also know, knew at, this, at that point um, that this was because these were clusters that were ending at some point that this was a, a situation where R0 was in fact below one. So these were stuttering uh, change. Um, and we can work out our not uh, from these kinds of data through, through um, um, a sort of intuitive way. So if you think of uh, our not being zero, then of course, even uh, on average, you would you would barely see any any subsequent cases. If it's quite close to one, just by throwing throwing a, a dice or uh, flipping a coin, you could get quite large, large clusters of stuttering change where, where they end, uh, where you can still see quite large outbreaks that end at some point. So the size of these clusters and the distribution of these clusters gives us information about what R0 should be. So they use these relationships, basically flipping coins as much as possible until they came up with a coin that represented R0 uh, in this situation, which was for, for the Singaporean setting about 0.7, I believe. That brings us straight away to, to another thing about how informative this was. So, so the reason they had these data was because they had a very good, um, uh, first of well, all, they had a good contact tracing system. Otherwise, you would never come up with 
data uh, this this nice uh, which but that's that's an intervention in itself right so that's why they were finding an r uh, that's below one and they were and, and we were able to see that that they were doing a good job with um, in addition to the contact tracing also uh, distancing and other measures um, so even though this is a nice exercise, it didn't give us the information we needed about the potential threat of the virus. <coughs> so then let's think of, of another sort of intuitive, uh, intuitive clue of, of viruses and how they spread. So we've learned a little bit about R and, and, and how that results into exponential growth, right? So every individual causes, for instance, two new individuals and those cause two new individuals. So every time you have to in, uh, multiply the number of infections by the single number, which results in exponential growth. So if we can work out the exponential growth by knowing R, you can imagine that we can also estimate R by knowing the exponential curve. So this is sort of the first thing that we do as soon as we see these cases occurring. And that's what we did in, in, in this case as well. And, and, and you, you get estimates of between uh, two and, and, and four probably. Um, problem though is especially at the beginning of these outbreaks, um, the, the um, detecting the case detection is of course quite, um, how should I say it, um, um, uh, unstable. It can change a lot. People are ramping up testing. People are not going uh, to seek care because they're scared or they are seeking care because uh, they need care etc so it's it's very vibrant and 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 um a way to circumvent this or at least overcome this or, or, or be a bit more uh, uh, confident about your estimates is by including more data than just um, the case data that were observed in, in Wuhan. Um, so Adam Kucharski did that early on in the outbreak by including not just the case data from Wuhan, but also international data. So um, uh, imported cases into other countries that have been probably infected in Wuhan and they built a, a modeling framework where they could um, um, uh, simulate the, the spread in Wuhan, uh, but as well simulate based on traveling data or connections with other places, how likely it was for those cases, people to get infected there and then take their, the infection back home. Um, so this gave actually an estimate that's quite similar to, to using the exponential growth curves about 2.2, but it gives a bit more confidence, right? Um, so then on to speed, how fast do we have to act? And, and I think uh, I said uh, I, I didn't mention the generation interval, but a lot of these estimates or a lot of the, the measures that were used uh, in, in estimating R rely on knowing something about the time between one person becoming infected and infecting the next one. This is the generation interval. And if we... Um, if we think of why that is important, um, maybe think about if, if, our, if the reproduction number is the hammer, then the generation interval is the amount of time that you have to grab the hammer and use it. So if that's short, we have a much harder time to, to control than, 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 if, than if there's quite, some long, uh, quite, quite a long uh, delay. If about two minutes, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so estimating generation intervals uh, can be done by, uh, this is actually similar data as I showed before, is the infector infectee pairs, um, where we know roughly when people have been in contact with each other and when they got symptoms. So you can work out roughly when people got infected uh, because you know their contact and you know uh, when they got symptoms, uh, the infector got symptoms and when the infectee got symptoms. Uh, now there's one thing, one one extra thing you need to know for that, and that is how long it takes to, from infection to, to uh, getting symptoms. And that's, that is something that uh, Jantine Bakker did very early on in the outbreak. I think this was published in the end of January already, uh, where she used data from travelers. So this is again taking advantage of the fact that you know these travelers, because transmission was at that point only occurring in Wuhan, you know when they were exposed roughly, and as soon as they came back and got symptoms, you can start estimating how long it took between um, infection and symptoms. So lastly, vision. Um, 
what's occurring under the surface of, of the of the iceberg. Um, I, I said it a little bit with the paper from Kucharski already. Uh, so using data on, on how much um, uh, travel there is going from Wuhan to other places, you can start getting an idea of, well, if, if there's only a, a small number of people that actually move out of Wuhan right before the lockdown. So looking at how many cases uh, you see outside of Wuhan, you can start you can start doing the math of how much there must be going on in Wuhan to to uh, to result in this number of cases. And and those estimates came up with with uh, an, an an underreporting of, of about uh, well that there should be ten to to forty fold more cases uh, than than um, um, than really observed. Um, so I'll move on to the um, um, pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, transmission, which was, I think, in terms of asymptomatic or silent infections, uh, the most important or the last piece of the puzzle that was very important. And, and that started with some, some actual observational um, uh, cases where they saw where they knew pairs where infection was likely to have occurred before the pair persons uh, started having symptoms. And they started quantifying that by estimating both the time between symptom onset of one case and its infectee and uh, uh, the infection, uh, the timing of infection. So this is the, the serial interval versus the uh, generation interval. So a bit of math behind this, but the, the estimates started coming that about 20 to 40% of infection could be uh, happening before symptom onset, although this, this differs um, depending on how effective your control is. So lastly, if I have time, uh, I'm on to, to put these pieces together. Uh, as I, I promised, uh, all these pieces of the puzzle uh, fit into to our, our uh, um, uh, strategies of how effective our control can be. And I'll give an example of contact tracing because that is sort of our first line of uh, defense in, in outbreaks, but it also uh, really relies on each of these things. So you can actually start simulating little outbreaks from the beginning, feed one person in and, and see what happens to these chains and see if you, and, and, and simulate also your contact tracing and how many contacts you have to effectively find to, to reduce the number of outbreaks. And just to go one by one by these, these final three ones is uh, that the, the R uh, numbers that we were finding here was around 2.5. So at that, that point, you could see that you had to be very effective with contact tracing by itself to be uh, effective. And the same is with speed. If you wait too long and you have already 40 cases, you have to be very effective to really uh, be effective with contact tracing by itself. And the same for transmission board before symptom onsets. We were seeing estimates of about 30%. Again, you had to be very efficient by contact tracing itself to be effective. Um, so in conclusion, uh, early outbreak investigations are imperfect, noisy, incomplete, but incredible valuable, especially if they're done in combined efforts and combined data sources. Um, and, uh, and I hope I have, have given a, a little bit of an idea of what we have learned from those efforts and how they have helped inform uh, public health um, early during the outbreak. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Corinne. So wonderful overview. And uh, we'll keep the questions for the panel discussion, if you don't mind. And I'll hand over now uh, the hosting to Marion, who will introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, so we are now shifting to the next uh, session and someone needs to make me presenter because we have a duo activity because just until uh, Five minutes ago, it looked like Aura Timon would not be able to make it, but she stepped in. So now I'm going to control the slides, but Aura Timon is going to uh, give her original planned presentation. So we are shifting now to um, a session that uh, is looking at um, uh, dealing with partial information during decision-making uh, uh, process during this unraveling pandemic from uh, a public health perspective and from a behavioral science perspective. And we start off uh, in this session with uh, Professor Aura Thiemann 
who has been very uh, actively uh, involved in leading the outbreak uh, response activities as uh, the head of the uh, 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 National Coordinating Center for Infectious Disease Control at the National Institute of Public Health. Uh, and she's also a professor uh, uh, of public health, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for your exact title, Aura. She's professor at the um, Amsterdam uh, uh, Free University or Amsterdam uh, uh, University uh, uh, Medical Center. Uh, and uh, Aura, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Mariona. I hope I'm unmuted by the organizers. Yes, I am. So I, I hold a chair in responses to communicable diseases in global health. Um, anyway, I think this presentation fits nicely in what Quirin already told us. And I have to acknowledge uh, kindly the help I got also from Marion because she slightly amended my slides because it was just last minute work. I was supposed to be in another meeting which finished earlier. So that's why I'm, I'm able to be with you today and I'm very happy to do so. So facts matter, don't they? Um, and that's the question. And not only facts matter, but also partial facts matter really. And um, uh, incomplete facts matter as well. So I'm going to discuss as to why they matter, to whom they matter, and how can we as scientists make use of the facts in order to, to uh, inform um, uh, the knowledge that public wants to have and in order to inform decision making. So what have we seen uh, lately is that scientists are really increasingly becoming part of the democratization of science. Science is for us all, of course, and it's very much accessible for us all. So that's why scientists like um, um, you are need to engage in communication and interpretation of science and to do so, they really need research, uh, they need skills that go beyond the research skills they, they, they already have. Um, and by engaging in this um, discussion with different audiences, uh, one must realize that um, people, uh, public uh, media, uh, sometimes uh, have inappropriate understanding or misinterpret the facts that we are producing. Um, and it's not a matter of blaming them, but it's just simply as that, that sometimes, uh, mostly science is very complicated, of course, to grasp. Um, sometimes they, make, they may have appropriate understanding of the facts, but yet disagree on the impact of the facts and on their, um, we would like to, to, to wait and stay on the previous slide, yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll point out when we move to the next one. So sometimes um, understanding uh, facts, public still um, disagrees with scientists on the impact or the implications of the facts presented. And uh, what's also important is that uh, people think of themselves that they are very well informed, really. Um, while scientists might also lack the antenna for quite grasping the questions and concern the public must, might have unknowingly. So if we move now to the next slide, why do I say that, that, that the public, that people think they, they uh, have quite a good understanding of knowledge is, and science is, it has been researched by our colleagues in the United Kingdom and they have um, displayed quite some questions to a broad audience in the UK and I don't have any reason to believe that that would be different in, in other Western countries than these results show us. So one of the important questions was, um, uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm clever enough to understand science and technology. Well, um, more than half of the people disagree to that. So they find themselves clever enough and um, probably that, that might be true. Um, uh, also, the question, I don't really know what a scientist does. Well, the public thinks, a lot of them, and a huge majority thinks that they quite know what we are doing. And um, they also think that they understand the point of all science being done today, which is quite uh, ambitious. Um, so um, moving to the next slide, um, I think that that uh, facts matter to the public and the public has quite the idea that they are able to, to grasp the whole uh, and can comprehend um, uh, the extent to which um, um, facts uh, are important in daily life. 
A second point I wanted to make is really that facts matter for enabling decision making and they are really crucial for decision making, mostly in times of crisis like today we are facing with regard to COVID. So I'd like to, um, to explain this based on uh, the clusters which we have been able to identify um, on the basis of the notifications that, that were provided to us by the public health services. So clusters matter because they give us an indication of accelerated transmission. So they point to us the settings where transmission of the virus happens at, a, at, a, um, uh, an, at an accelerated uh, pace. So if we move to the next one, I would like to point to you really, the most frequently observed clusters um, as reported by the public health services to the RIVM, and this is a very nice cluster analysis done by the Department of uh, Epidemiology of the Center for Infectious Disease Control, so I acknowledge their help in this. And they have looked into the most frequently observed clusters in the past weeks in various age groups. So um, to the left-hand side of you, of this uh, picture, you will see the clusters in uh, youngsters aged 12 to 17. And as you can see, most, or most, most of the clusters of their majority is, uh, has been uh, recognized in school, in the setting school where they are, obviously they are involved with um, um, because of their um, daily participation in school. And also uh, secondary to schools transmission um, in this age group uh, takes place in, in the household there where they um, meet their siblings and uh, where they meet their parents, of course. Um, please notice also the scale of this graph, which goes from zero to uh, really uh, 15. And then I would like to ask your attention for the second part of this slide on your right hand side, which points you really the clusters in the age group uh, 18 to 25. Well, this age group has been um, labeled in the media as being the drivers of the current epidemic we are facing now. And um, I think this is uh, somewhat an underpinning of this, um, uh, of this fact. So we see here a totally different uh, scale. We see here a scale running from zero to 150. So the 150 clusters per day, mind you. And this points out to the places where young people, 18 to 25, um, easily transmit the virus to others uh, in the same age group. So what you see here is really the importance of travel being really the summer holidays in August, followed by the importance of socializing with friends, really the parties, the, the use of, of, of restaurants, bar, as bars, cafes, where the infection has been propagated from person to person in the early period of August and, and early September. And then the huge massive transmission in households there where those young people live together in student homes or, or um, meet each other in their private time. So if we move to the next one, um, this slide shows you the next age groups, again, moving into the age groups of 26 and 39, again, an age group that has been successfully involved in, in a replica of transmission, transmi transmitting the virus. We see here a, a different picture with really travel, basically holidays in August, followed by transmission in the work settings. So people come back from, from holidays and transmit infection in, in the work settings, but also again, the role of transmission in uh, all kinds of situations where they engage with friends and, and social activities. And if we move into the age group of 40 to 64, which is the, uh, on your uh, right hand side, you see again, a, a comparable picture with what you see in the in the younger age group really, transmission in, uh, at the workplace and transmission driven by social activities. So if we move now to the next one, then we are of course very interested in what happened really in the older age groups. What you see here is also sort of delayed cluster forming in the older age groups. We have seen previously the mostly clusters in August, August, September. Well, in the older age group, 65 to 115, <laughs> so it goes basically to very old ages. The most clusters really take place in nursing homes there where those people are cared for. And um, this is also the picture we were very afraid of. We have been warning for the fact that 
the drivers of this transmission would be the young age groups, basically students and young pupils who are coming back from holidays and engaging in social activities. But sooner or later, and in this case later, of course, transmission will be uh, taken up by the older age groups and the virus will be successfully transmitted in the settings where the age groups um, meet each other. So in, uh, in this case, the older people in nursing homes. Um, so having said that, I would like to move to the next slide, pointing again out how important it is when you make decisions to base them on facts that are um, um, driven by, by scientific knowledge. And I'll go back to it, how the decisions were made, made in order to measure us. But at the same time, while we were looking into those cluster forming and looking into the places where infection was transmitted easily from person to person, the societal discourse took place, of course, and was carried out at an unprecedented level because the public and experts starting to debate with each other with respect to all kinds of measures that they deemed important starting with school closures, moving um, into other discussions about the role of ventilation and aerosol transmission, discussing, as of course, about the importance of lockdown, the timing of lo lockdown, the extent to which lockdown should be uh, uh, undertaken. So um, discussions that sort of went parallel with what we saw in, in the results of the contact tracing and cluster analysis that was done here. So if we move to the next slide, I would like again to point out how important it is that we as scientists really have this, uh, this position as a kind of uh, um, infodemic manager unicorn as, as depicted by the WHO, uh, which requires us to be um, adaptable at the same time, uh, to be um, uh, open to monitoring evaluations to be able to understand public health, to understand outbreak response, to understand societal developments, to be able to communicate, uh, to be able to understand social science and behavior change. So sort of uh, a lot of things that we, we take upon us uh, when we engaged in scientific discussions with media, uh, public and policy makers. Um, and if we move to the next slide, then I would like to point again out your attention to another important fact that is, that is um, underpinning the measures that we have been taken nowadays, and that is the role of urban areas as disease amplifiers. So not only we have uh, now insight in the clusters where the, disease, where the infection is transmitted easily, we now are able also to point out to the very places where these, um, these clusters um, 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 lead to um, an extensive transmission of the virus, and that is definitely the urban settings. And we are talking about major hotspots in the Netherlands, in the regions of Amsterdam, um, in the regions of Rotterdam, in the region of The Hague and Utrecht. And those are really the urban areas pointed out to be the places where um, uh, at an at a, at a, um, extensive level, again, the disease is spread. And if we move now to the next slide, what have we learned from cluster forming and what have we learned from, um, from the evidence that has been gathered by, by source of contact tracing by public health services and analyzed by the RIVM is of course that um, if we want to con control COVID, we need to, to break the waves of COVID. We are now in the middle of the second wave and we really need clever measures to break those waves. And, lead to, to flattening the, the well-known well curve. Um, and to do so, um, we really need insights from various so, uh, information uh, sources. So we need to be aware of the um, compliance data with respect to behavior, that data that are provided to us by the behavioral unit of the RIVM. And when we look into um, breaking the waves of transmission, then we really needed to take additional measures in addition to the basic rules in the Netherlands, such as the social distancing, the one and a half meter. Uh, we really needed to focus on measures that would diminish the group size, would diminish the duration of contact, will allow people to work from home, as we know that workplaces are places where the virus is transmitted efficiently will um, allow people to um, sort of diminish the amount of people they have 
they, they, they receive visits from at home to reduce the household transmission and of course to um, delimit, to, to diminish the non-essential travel. Um, and these, those effects of these measures that are really sort of aggregated here in this picture are being um, projected and modeled by uh, the modelers of the RIVM, again, the group around um, uh, Jakob Wallinga. And they look into the uh, number of new uh, in, um, admissions on the intensive care per day. And they make these projections um, in the absence of measures that would be the red line um, that would, would have been the, the reality in the first wave if we didn't have, uh, if we didn't um, interfere with measures and look into the developments in the second wave, which is to your right hand side. And there you see really what would happen if the measures that are aim at reducing the number of contacts, the intensity of contacts and the duration of contacts will have no effect or rather a slight effect on them, on the outbreak. And in green, you will see that you see the curve um, in which we expect that the measures will, will help, will contribute to diminishing these uh, intensive care admissions. And we are now at a kind of point of um, um, that we are not very sure whether we will develop further in the in the direction of the blue line or the green line. Well, the most recent data I've seen, I've seen today point us, point us much, slightly more in the, in the um, direction of the green line. So I'm sort of, um, uh, yeah, well, let's say a bit of confidence that the measures that have been undertaken on the 13th of October will reach their effect that we really want to have. But this effect will, uh, needs a, a period of time in order to, to be able to be shown on the number of admissions. So um, if we move to the next slide, I would like to, I guess I need to conclude. Uh, well, I would like to um, also point out that um, source and contact tracing is limited. And that's also something we really need to take into account when we um, look into the data I have presented to you. While at the beginning of, of the summer, we were able to have a, a pretty good um, uh, view on what, um, uh, what happened in public health. Uh, we see now that the source of contact tracing is now um, diminished to about 80% of all cases. So that would mean that data need to be interpreted with caution. Um, so again, partial data, but still important, partial facts, but important to underpin decisions that need to be taken under high time pressure. So uh, moving to the next slide, I would like to conclude by looking into what COVID has taught us and point to you this very nice editorial published in Nature Medicine recently, uh, in which um, um, there is a kind of plead to, for our scientists to keep an open line of communication with the public, and I would add with the policymakers as well, and to point out that COVID was really the main catalyzer of this direct engagement within the scientists and the public. And this happened at an unprecedented magnitude, and I don't have any reason to think that this will diminish any time. So by saying that, I would like to really conclude and um, uh, leave us, leave, leave you with, with this uh, message that now more than ever, we need to be open-minded and keep this communication line open. So I would like to thank you for your attention and wish you a very nice um, um, meeting further. Thank you, um, Aura. Um, and um, as, as you have to leave uh, in, in, I think, 10 minutes time, I suggest that we have a few questions. Um, there was a, there's a question from Caroline van der Zand, just back from Australia, I, I know. Uh, she's asking, would it not have helped if, if uh, someone had informed public and media of potential consequences and measures of a pandemic before it happened. So as a form of pandemic preparedness. Well, um, obviously you can never inform enough the public, but I think there have, has been throughout the past um, uh, decades, uh, definitely um, a clear message from the scientists. And 
um, especially from the virologists who have warned us time and again that um, that the pandemics are, are, are here to stay and the amount of, of um, interaction between humans and animals nowadays is is of such a magnitude that pandemics will be really the reality of, of tomorrow. So um, I'm not sure whether this message has been um, um, understood well enough by the public, but I think it was conveyed uh, quite often. And of course, we co you can only do only a better job in communicating. But the question is, does the public have this absorption capacity to understand something that is not yet here and might happen? And you never know when it will happen and what the impact would be. But um, yeah, I think this is a message that we probably need to communicate even better and repeat time and again. So I, I do agree actually with the, the one who, quest who asked this question. Yes, I think we will come back to that in the panel discussion as well. But, but thank you very much for taking the time despite the, the hectic uh, uh, days. You're welcome. Yeah, so we will move on to the uh, next uh, speaker, uh, which is uh, Professor Marijn de Bruin, uh, Professor of uh, Health Psychology of Radboud University Medical Center and also of the University of Aberdeen. Uh, and uh, he also is currently head of scientific research uh, of the Corona Behavioral Unit at RIVM. Marijn, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Excellent. Slides are there. Right. Okay. So um, uh, yeah, um, I'm going to give a behavioral perspective on the on the pandemic, at least in the Netherlands, uh, in the next 15 minutes. If the slide is willing to move to the next, there we go. So the talk will be a little bit about the context. I promise to not spend too much time on this uh, to Marion because she, she would like to delve into the content. Uh, I completely agree, but I want to give a little bit of context because it's such a new group and we haven't been able to tackle everything that we wanted. Um, um, and then I'll give a behavioral perspective briefly on the, on the first and the second wave, and then um, uh, uh, a reflection on how it is to work on such a complex topic in a, in a complex system. So um, in February last year, I was, uh, I was a happy, uh, happy and peaceful academic. And uh, I did quite a bit of work on infectious diseases, uh, uh, often in the context of, of clinical trials, like with HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, and I did quite a lot on um, uh, methodology and systematic reviews and behavioral trials. Um, and then uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, came along and um, uh, we had the first wave coming up. And at that time, uh, I and some colleagues felt that we have this very um, mature behavioral science discipline in the Netherlands, and it wasn't fully um, activated in the pandemic response uh, at that moment. So at that uh, time, we, um, uh, yeah, we started to uh, make that clear to particular players in the, in the uh, crisis structure in the Netherlands. And one of these is the uh, National Core Team of Crisis Communication, N NKC. And um, um, we let them know that we have this very mature behavioral science in the Netherlands and that we think it could be of use in the, in the pandemic response. So we uh, came in their advisory board, uh, some of my colleagues and myself. Um, but then um, we still felt that it wasn't quite enough because we were just giving recommendations on how to communicate about the virus and the recommendations to people uh, so we decided to further escalate and then we came in touch with the, uh, uh, the Public Health Institute in the Netherlands, uh, where Aura is also working, and uh, we started a new behavioral unit. And since then, from a peaceful academic, I've moved into sort of a Sherlock Holmes on a rocket. Um, that's at least how it feels uh, over the last six months. Um, so when we started the Corona Behavioral Unit at the Public Health Institute, the RIVM, uh, in March, we, did, we had no formal position in the crisis structure. Uh, we didn't really have a name and we didn't have funding. And then um, we met and we decided to kick this off. And a week later, we had a scientific advisory board with 30 behavioral researchers from across the Public Health Institute, from lots of different domains who were part-time available for this unit. 
and we had uh, three seniors for, um, for most of the week. And then another five days later, uh, we had intensive meetings in The Hague about uh, the government communication. Um, we developed a theoretical framework for uh, COVID-19 prevention behaviors, which I will discuss in a minute. And we also developed a taxonomy of behavioral advice, which we shared with, uh, with, uh, with the government, uh, uh, the crisis communication structure. And then another seven days later, we had a substantial research grant and we could also start our research. And I'm, I'm just saying this because we started in, uh, in, in, in March, the beginning of April. And while the virus was going like this, we were also going like this. So we had this exponential growth of the unit and we were still developing our research and our procedures and our people and our processes while we also were trying to deliver and have an impact on the, on, on the pandemic. So that's just a little bit of, of background uh, before I'm gonna present uh, some more of the, of the content of what we've been doing. So the Corona Behavioral Unit aims to contribute to uh, the effectiveness of the COVID-19 prevention measures by making available state-of-the-art behavioral and communication science and trying to translate that for government policy and communication. Um, we focus on not only on the virus, we also look a little bit broader at, uh, at people's mental and social well-being because that's also an important side of, uh, of the measures in the, in the crisis. So the scientific basis for this Corona Behavioral Unit at the Public Health Institute is a, a scientific advisory board, which we carefully uh, uh, selected. There, there are 15 professors in health psychology, behavior change, public health, uh, and with people with specific expertise on, on certain target groups like young people, uh, elderly people, people with a migration background, and people with different expertise in, in, in media use. So mass media, online media, more community-based interventions. So all this expertise is basically available uh, and advises this behavioral unit on, uh, on the questions that we're facing. And we've also initiated a research program. Uh, we do research internally, which is um, literature reviews. Um, we do large uh, survey research. Uh, we're in the seventh or eighth wave now of that, of that survey. On an average, we've got about 50 to 60,000 people responding to that. And we, we combine that with uh, more in-depth qualitative interviews to get more into the detail and the context of uh, what's going on. And then we've got lots of external collaborations where we do research with groups with, who use CCTV cameras to look at how crowded it is on places and social distancing, social media, discrete choice experiments and, and these type of things. So um, to go into the content, um, and behavioral scientists often work with theories and, and theories aren't just theory. They're, they're basically based on a lot of research. These can be observational studies, but often they, they also include experimental studies and they can be experiments in the lab, but also in real life. And then all this evidence accumulates and, and people formulate theories. And, um, and, and we've combined uh, two big works on, on behavioral theory to uh, form this theoretical framework uh, for uh, COVID prevention behaviors. So the first set of key determinants, as we call it, uh, for, uh, for initiating uh, uh, hand washing, an increase in hand washing or initiating social distancing or initiating other prevention behaviors uh, are risk perception, response efficacy, barriers and cues to action. So, with risk perception, we refer to uh, how vulnerable people feel that they are to the virus and how severe they think the uh, contracting uh, COVID-19 is. Um, but this risk perception can also be how, what is the chance that when I have the virus that I transmit it to somebody else and how severe do I think that this is? So the, the virus presents the risk to people and people may be motivated to respond to that risk if they feel that they can do something about it. And that is captured with response efficacy. So response efficacy refers to, for example, hand washing or social distancing or quarantine and people's perception on how effective those measures are to prevent the transmission to others. So if people think that there's a higher risk and if people think that they can respond effectively to that risk, it's likely that they are motivated to, uh, to follow those recommendations. But of course, when people have intentions, there can be barriers. 
These can be social barriers like people in my environment aren't distancing, but they can also be physical barriers like it's very hard to do groceries and keep distance because the grocery stores are not very well suited for keeping distance in the first place. So there's all these barriers and self-efficacy refers to people's abilities and competences to overcome those barriers. And the final determinant here is, is Q to action. Um, so people might be motivated and still not really perform the behavior, but then there might be a good campaign or a press conference or somebody in your environment who contracts uh, COVID-19 and that can then uh, be enough to tip you into, uh, into deciding that you want to initiate those prevention behaviors. Uh, this is more for the acute phase, but if people have to sustain those behaviors, there's also other things that become additionally important. Um, so in the maintenance phase, uh, where we are really now, um, it's very important that we look, well, what are the key drivers for people to, to maintain those behaviors? And um, uh, for that, it's really important that people understand how the measures work um, to uh, fight the pandemic and that they can see how adhering to those guidelines will benefit them, their personal goals in their lives and, and their social environment also in the long run. And there's other things like self-regulation. Self-regulation refers to our ability to, to overcome barriers, uh, the formation of habits, so we see that, for example, the hygiene behaviors like not shaking hands, washing hands, sneezing in your elbow, these are quite suitable for forming habits. But the social distancing behaviors, they're not, they don't come naturally. And it's, it's much harder there to, uh, to form a habit of social distancing and avoiding crowded places than it is to form habits for, uh, for the hygiene behaviors. Resources refer to our physical and mental resources um, to cope with the pandemic. So people might suffer quite a lot of loneliness during the pandemic, and it might actually make it much harder to, uh, to uh, comply to these rules in the long term. And again, environment appears here. So the, the physical environment and the social environment has a big influence on, uh, on our behavior, both in a positive and negative sense. So that's basically our theoretical framework. And um, uh, so I presented briefly that our, uh, our scientific basis is the advisory board and our own research. And we also use this theoretical framework. So now I'm gonna briefly uh, discuss two applications. Uh, the one of the first things that we did in the crisis is that we mapped all the behavioral recommendations that were there on the government website and on the public health uh, institute website. And we basically built sort of a taxonomy of that. And this taxonomy starts at the top with uh, all the recommendations for COVID-19 uh, prevention behaviors. And then we split them up in, in different at-risk groups. So there were recommendations for asymptomatic people, uh, symptomatic people, and people with symptomatic people in the households. And then for all these people, there were recommendations for different settings. So that's the next level. So for the workplace, for at home, for outdoors, etc. And then for all these settings, there were sometimes the same and sometimes different recommendations. So we mapped all that out. And then we scored all those recommendations in terms of, is it clear who has to do what, when, and where? Because these are really important conditions for people being able to uh, comply with those recommendations, but also for people to make these habits. And the more you make these behaviors habits, the longer people can probably sustain them. And a second part uh, that we coded in on was why. So with all these behavioral recommendations, are people explained how does this work to uh, prevent transmission of the virus? And why is that relevant? Because people need to be able to, um, to motivate themselves in the long term. So people really need to understand how it works and, and why this is a good idea. And then the third component is how complex is the behavior. So some behaviors might be quite simple, like um, uh, sneezing in your elbow, at least when you can make that a habit. I see my children can do it after one week. And maybe because I'm older, but I still have to think about it. So they made this behavior much more habitual than I did. But some behaviors are more complex than others, like social distancing. Social distancing is very strongly influenced by people in our environment and how the physical environment is, uh, is made up. So um, uh, the more complex a behavior is, the more support people need or the more resources or the more communication. So we basically coded all those recommendations for this 
and uh, that has uh, resulted in a reformulation of quite a lot of these uh, communications on the government website. So, so that's one way that we try to make ourselves valuable. Um, the other is that we did a lot of research and I'm going to briefly show some of the, the, the research against these, uh, um, this pattern of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, diagnosis in the Netherlands where um, yeah, the, the virus came in the Netherlands uh, uh, sort of, uh, well, in this picture mid-March and then you see the first wave which looks very small because we're only testing patients in hospitals at the time. And, uh, and then in the summer, uh, the transmission levels were very low the national core team of crisis communication was dismantled um, and it went back to the normal structure of policy making. So we didn't have this crisis structure in the, in the government anymore. And, uh, and also the press conferences were, uh, were, were, were put on hold. It was summer. And then uh, you slowly see it creep up again. And now it's also much higher, but that's also because we're also testing all the, all the symptomatic people. So they don't necessarily need to be in the hospital at all. So we're testing many, many more people now than previously. So what we did, and this is in, in Dutch, I'll translate. What we did is that we measured behaviors, for example. So, so here we see the hygiene behaviors. The top behavior is not shaking hands. The bottom behavior is how carefully people wash their hands. And in between is the how often people wash their hands and uh, using a paper towel for, uh, for when you have a runny nose, et cetera. And you see actually that it's, it's, it's very stable, these behaviors. So you would say that these are actually quite habitual. Um, but when we look at, at social distancing, um, oh, sorry, this is, this is washing hands. Uh, we make, made a distinction here. Uh, so for washing hands, we look at all these different situations in which, we, which people have to wash their hands. And one decline that we did see is that people wash their hands less and less when they were visiting others or when they were coming at home. And these are actually quite, can be quite relevant moments because if you've just been to the supermarket or in public transport and you actually bring yeah, bring the outside world in your house. So you can consider this to be quite important moments that it did decrease the hand washing. Uh, this is more the social distancing. You see here that the, the, the pattern has decreased over time. Uh, this is like keeping one and a half meters distance and not visiting people with a vulnerable health status, etc. So there you see a, a decrease over time as the, as the virus levels also went down. Here we have, uh, what we also do is that we measure social distancing in lots of different situations. So these are all different contexts. And what we see is that people are more, most successful in keeping distance when they're outdoors and, and less successful when it's indoors. From the beginning of the pandemic, it was hardest for people to do it in the supermarket and at work. Um, they still did it very well when they had visitors in their household or when they were visiting somebody else, but that also decreased quite a lot over time. And this is uh, for people who actually have symptoms uh, uh, and don't have symptoms. So the, the dark lines are the people with symptoms that could indicate uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then the yellow is the, the symptoms that people attribute to, for example, their asthma or their hay, hay fever. And then the, the, the sort of the purple is the people without symptoms. And this is all the places that they went to in the last week. So the first one is going to work. The second is shopping. The third is uh, visiting family, friends, etc. And the most remarkable thing is that you see that symptoms doesn't really seem to correlate that much with people's social activity. So if you plot all this together, I had to do this very quickly, but if you plot this all together, if we look at the second wave, also what Aura just explained, is um, uh, that there were a lot of infections in households, visitors, family get, uh, gatherings, but also pubs, uh, uh, travel and the, and, uh, and the workplace in particular. And what we were seeing in our behavioral data is that exactly in those places, we saw that people were much more socially active. So we had more visitors. We more often went to the pub, to the restaurant, to work. We saw higher per contact infection risk because there was a decline in this distancing, hand washing declined, and people were there often with symptoms. Um, so, um, uh, so we actually could map these behavioral data very nicely, if you want to call it like that, on the, on the transmission data. So I said that we look a little bit broader than just the behavioral data. We also look at all those risk perceptions and self-efficacy and response efficacy, but also at, at the costs of the, the pandemic on things like loneliness. And what you see here is that loneliness was quite high in the initial lockdown, the intelligent lockdown that we had initially. 
then it decreased as all the measures were uh, made more flexible. And at the moment it's increasing again because we're locking down again. And, and the same we see for mental well-being, uh, which, was, uh, which was worse uh, uh, at, at the beginning, then it improved and now it's worse again. So it's really finding a balance also for people to maintain all those behaviors between all the other things they need to do in their lives, their well-being, and of course, keeping the virus out of the house. So I'm uh, probably towards the end of my time. Um, so I'll briefly um, uh, say something about uh, that. I think my experience of studying this complex topic in a, in a complex system. So what we've seen here is that there's multiple behaviors. There's a really a really long list of behaviors that people need to comply to. At the, at the moment, there are six different versions of quarantine and isolation uh, recommendations for when people come from a, a country abroad, when there's somebody infected in the household, when they're infected themselves, it's actually quite complicated. We see that the behavior is influenced by psychology, the physical environment, the social environment, and all these things interact. Um, so uh, distancing is influenced by crowding, how difficult it is, social norms, etc. So it's, it's really a complex system that we're studying. And, uh, and there's clear costs in terms of unhealthier lifestyles, loneliness and anxiety that are associated with, with both the virus and the measures. And, uh, and, uh, and what I also found complex in the last six months in, in doing this work is, is sort of finding a place for behavioral science in the system. Because once there is a crisis, it's, it's difficult to add new parts in the crisis structure. Uh, so that takes time before you sort of prove in your value and, uh, and, and, and found ways to make yourself useful uh, for, for the other disciplines that are working there. So in a nutshell, um, as I see it, the, the problem in the crisis is the virus and the solution lies in human behavior until we've got this vaccine and then still everybody needs to get vaccinated. Uh, behavior has multiple interacting components, so it's quite complicated, but through research and expert input, we better understand what's, what's going on and um, uh, through communication, we manage to directly and indirectly uh, influence, hopefully, at least how people experience uh, the pandemic, but also have a positive impact on their prevention behaviors and, uh, and, uh, and the pandemic as a whole. So that was my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marijn. Um, I am going to... Uh, well, one question first for Queen and Aura, because Aura needs to leave. And that is, um, you both mentioned the importance of looking at data, um, where Aura looks at the available incoming data from the municipal health services. Queen looks at data that is publicly available. So can you both comment on, from the perspective now, do you see uh, opportunities for an infrastructure, a data infrastructure for the future? Maybe Aura first, if I still hope you're there. Uh, Marion, I don't think Aura is still here. So maybe pop the question for Quirin. Oh, Quirin then. Yeah, uh, I like that question quite a bit because um, that is, of course, a challenge that we have had as researchers as well, or maybe a challenge, maybe a bit of frustration even uh, that you feel there is uh, um, uh, much more data to learn for than that we get the opportunity to learn from. Um, so, so I would say, yes, I think uh, we would gain a lot by having a, a system in place to expedite the um, um, accessibility of data for scientists, especially if it's, if it's public data collected by the public sphere, such as GGD or the Yeah, if you look at the WHO also, they, they've got all these nice documents for preparing for a pandemic and uh, uh, social and behavioral science and, uh, and, and public health response. And, and one big chunk is, is actually evaluate and learn for the next time. Uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, we can learn a lot and, and it's, it would be very good to see how we can line up the different data sources to actually yeah, not only capture the virus and the hospital uh, uh, cases, but also the behavioral data and, uh, and see if we can actually have a system that connects and, and maybe uses also, at least from my point of view, a bit more the objective measures for, uh, for behavior 
uh, as, as we necessarily have to rely quite a bit now on, uh, on the more subjective uh, self-reported data. Yeah. Yes, okay, so yes, I would have had to leave. I sent her a text message, but so let's take this discussion further in the panel then. Um, because uh, there's, there's numerous questions in the chat. So if you would like to start or maybe also responding in the chat, that would, that would be great. Um, because I think uh, it is time for a short break, but stay with it. We all know that uh, Zoom is ruling our lives nowadays. Um, and if you are like me, uh, that gets tiresome. Maybe it's my age, but uh, but uh, we have someone who is really specializing in helping us uh, uh, work with this through these times. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Patrick van Luik, uh, who is a former Olympian, so he does have the stamina for this. Uh, <laughs> that's one one uh, observation. Uh, he won silver in the 200 meter and gold in the 4x100 relay team during the European Championships in uh, Helsinki and is currently a founder of BioCheck, a Rotterdam-based company that develops database programs to help people to recover from a burnout, which I hope we don't have yet. So, uh, Patrick, floor is yours. Thank you, Marion, for the great introduction. I hope, I hope everybody hears me clearly. Um, all right, perfect. Uh, everybody, please join in in this uh, presentation or energize what I have. It's the most fun uh, and most important presentation of today. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's not the most important, but it's still important for us and for you as scientists to stay healthy because you are the ones that need to guide us to the dark days uh, uh, we have uh, right now. Um, I was inspired by doing some exercises on the job while I was at the Olympics in China and um, I was sitting in a bus uh, looking outside of the window and I saw a, a taxi driving and then the taxi stopped and I saw the passenger walking out of the taxi and then I saw the, the, the chauffeur, the taxi driver himself, step out of the car and doing, I don't know, 10 or 20 push-ups and then step back into the taxi and drove away. So I thought by myself, wow. If he really wants to, if you really want to be healthy, everybody can do it on the job. So I have some exercises that uh, you can do. And it's my responsibility today to give you some easy to use exercises you can use on your job. And it, it doesn't matter if you have a sitting job. It doesn't matter if you have a standing job. These exercises make sure that your body uh, keeps healthy or keeps moving healthy. Because, you know, we have, uh, we like to sit like this behind Zoom and see all those small words and we're looking into it what do we see right here right now so the whole body the whole the neck and the shoulders uh, we have problems with that so we're going to do some exercises uh, for that and that's because we we like to live in our comfort circle and our comfort circle is like this it's small and it can expand or it can increase but the big problem is if our comfort circle is this we always think that our comfort circle stays the same but it is not like that because our comfort circle grow of it gets smaller into the years because a comfort circle is a, it, it has comfort. So it doesn't mean you don't like to touch the borders. So that means that over the years, the circle gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you always move the same, you're gonna have problems with your movement. So I thought by myself, we have to go, we have to get uncomfortable to become comfortable. So I have some uncomfortable exercises with uncomfortable names. So you're gonna memorize them and you can do them. It only costs maybe 20 or 30 seconds or, 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 or a minute. It doesn't matter. Uh, and these exercises are going to help you to main uh, the movement of your body. So we're going to do that. I hope everybody is with me. Um, the first strange exercise what we have is we like to work like this the whole day. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our neck to the back like this. And I hope everybody's joining in. You have to put your neck and make it under the chin. You have to put your neck all the way to the back. And we're going to hold that for 10 seconds. Make that under the chin as big as possible. Let's go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 
one, and release. I call this exercise the anti-bump. We're gonna do it again. We're gonna put the neck all the way to the back. Let's go. 10, nine, eight, seven. Make it on the chin. Six, five, four, three, two, one, and release. You're gonna feel something right now, right? So what we're gonna do right now, this one is important as well. We like to work like this. So we're sitting in a job and our shoulders, they come up. They're gonna move like this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the opposite of this movement. We're gonna try to put the shoulders as low as possible. So you're gonna use some force to push the shoulders all the way down. So really try to put the shoulders all the way down and use for the force for that. Also you, Marijn, I see you. Let's go. Yeah, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and release. So you feel the tension release. We're gonna do it again. Let's go. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and release. So you feel a tension release. It's really important to do these kind of exercises. It can go really fast and you have a lot of profit from it. The next one is a normal one. We always do like this. So when we have problems with our neck, we like to move like this. Huh? I call this exercise the giraffe. What we're gonna do right now is we're gonna make our neck as long as possible and you wanna reach the, the, the ceiling with your ear. So you wanna go like this and make your neck as long as possible. We're gonna go like this. Let's go, Marijn. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and release. And you feel it, huh? Let's go with the other side. Try to reach the ceiling. 10, nine, and drop the shoulders, eight, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and release. I hope everybody is joining me with this exercise. The next one is very important. I call it the don't drop your life exercise. This one is with your phone. So what I want, this is your life, huh? This is your life right here. You don't need to drop it. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna put our fingers underneath the phone. So on the side and on the side, you, you're not touching. So you're not doing like this. I hope everybody's joining with me. This one is very important for the shoulders. It's gonna make your shoulders really loose. So everybody has his phone, has his life right here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna turn around like this. And we're gonna make it a circle. Yes, don't drop your don't drop your life. Let's go. We're gonna do it again. Turn around and make a shoulder. So this one, we can also make it the other round, all the way around. Up. Everybody still has his life. Let's turn to the other one. We're gonna do the left one. This one is more difficult, huh? You don't trust your life with your left hand, huh? Let's go. We're gonna change. We're gonna change. Whew. One more. We're gonna change. Ah. And then we have to go to the other side and we're done. Let's go. Move. And we're gonna move. Ah. These exercises are very important for the shoulders because the only exercise what we normally do is up, down, front or back. But circling or rotating your shoulders, we, we rarely do this, but our, our shoulders can make this movement. So really use this exercise. So these exercises are for the sitting jobs, but I also have some exercise for the standing jobs. So 
I would like you to stand up and we're gonna do some exercise for that. What we have, what we have right now is an exercise and we're gonna rotate the hips. So we're gonna put it a little bit down like this. So yeah, we're gonna rotate the hips. I call this exercise the stripper. So we're gonna move really big and rotate the hips. The rotates the hips and make the rotation as big as possible. Rotate the hips and the other way around. Rotate, rotate, perfect. One more. Yes. Okay. The exercise, what I'm going to show right now, I call it um, the, the, the spoon. And the spoon, we have the pot. This is the pot. This has to be still. And we're going to use this as a spoon to stir the soup. So this one is still. And we're going to use our upper body to rotate without moving the hips to the left or to the right. So this stays still. And we're only gonna, we're only gonna lose your upper body to move. We go to one side and keep those hips still. You're not in the club. You're not in the club today. Let's go, other way around. Other way around. Yes, perfect. One more. One more. Yes. Okay, the last exercise for the standing one. And this is very important. This is, I call it, I need to go right now. This exercise is very, very important. We're gonna sit here for 30 seconds on flat feet. I know that is very difficult. 20 seconds left. This is one of the most important exercises for our back. Our back usually has pressure. When you sit, when you lay down, or when you're standing, you have pressure on your back. And this is one of the exercises, the contra movements of our body, to make sure that we don't have the pressure and then we get some space in our back. If you have back problems, you can use this exercise extremely well. So. Okay, and we get up. I told you that some of these movements will make you look uncomfortable, but they will help you to make sure that you're comfortable. What's very important with this kind of exercises is when you have exercises, you are gonna be active, but you also have to get some recovery moment. So what we're gonna do right now is a 30 second breathing, uh, um, breathing technique to breathe in and breathe out to relax so you are able to recover, so you're ready for the next performance. What we're gonna do right now so we're going to breathe in. Let me see. You're going to breathe in. Breathe out. Wait a little bit. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So um, 
If you want to have more information, you can check us out at biocheck.nl. Don't forget that you're always active and you're going from the one uh, meeting to another meeting to another meeting to another meeting. And if you don't have time to do some breathing exercises between or do some exercises between, you're going to uh, have problems later on. So keep yourself healthy by doing these easy exercises. It only will cost you 20 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute and then you're done for the rest. I want to thank you all. Thank you very much, Patrick. <laughs> and You're welcome. Um, everyone, check the link to Patrick's uh, uh, company in the chat. Okay, so now that everyone is uh, revived, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the final speaker uh, of the uh, uh, the presentations, and that's uh, Alexander uh, Kohlmann. He is uh, associate professor uh, and head of health economics section at the Free, uh, Free University of Amsterdam. He's a health economist with an interest in institutional economics and applied health econo econometrics and biostatistics. In his work, he is keen to combine quantitative research and health economic policy. Alexander, take it away. Thank you. Um, just a, just a, a question for organization. Is there, uh, is there going to be some time for people to use the bathroom or is that, um, are we just assuming that people don't need the bathroom? And uh, do we need a, a five minute stop? <laughs> okay, five minutes. Thank you. So uh, Patrick, you could actually do a couple of more exercises if you want, for those that are fine. Yeah, I can uh, I can shake them shake them out. It doesn't matter. Um, we can do some exercise. This one is also really good. So, but maybe everybody's going to the toilet right now, so I'm doing the exercise for nobody. I don't know. No, well, I, the... I, well, I assume some people will still be present. Yeah. Okay. So the biggest problem is what we have is our hands also. Eh? So we have like our neck, our shoulders and our back. And I showed some exercise for that. Uh, but people also have problems with their wrist eh? the whole day using their wrist like this. So there are simple exercises for the wrist, what you can do as well. Uh, we all know that uh, from, a, from our instinct, we're shaking our hands, you know. So when your hands are like feeling don't feel well, you're going to shake them a little bit. You also can do that more excessive. So what we can do is we can shake our hands for 10 seconds and we're going to shake them like this. But you try to do that as hard as possible. So you're going to be like this and you're going to try to do like this. Try to really shake them and really be loose. You're going to do that for 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. So... We're moving this way, but we can also move this way. So you can also shake your hand like this. So what we're going to do is you're going to open up your hands like this, and we're going to shake your hands this way. Also, 10 seconds, 10, 9. And really keep the hands loose. Really keep them loose. 6, 5, 4. Come on, Moran, I only see you. 3, <laughs> 2, 1. All right, and release. We have also one, this is more like this one. 10 seconds, 10. Don't make a picture, please. Eight, <laughs> seven. I'm afraid that's going on. Six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, and release. So now you feel your shoulders a little bit and your hands a little bit. So what we can do right now with our hands is we're gonna we're gonna try so you're gonna really gonna make a fist so you're really gonna make a, like a, a hard fist and with the fist is you're gonna try well really put some tension on the wrist you're gonna try to make a circle you want to make a circle as big as possible well really making a fist so really put some power into the fist and make a circle so you're gonna feel all kinds of small 
ailments and pain, and pain stuff, everything. We're gonna move it like this for 10 seconds, but really try to, to make a hard fist. So don't have like a soft fist, but really, really punch to it. And then make the other one, the other way one. All right, so we're gonna change this one. Yeah. Really try to make a good, a big circle and really punch it. So really squeeze, squeeze into the fist. Really squeeze into the fist. All right, another circle around, other way around. Yes. So, and then you feel they are good, huh? You feel some, some bleeding through it. You feel that they are ready to go. So these are exercises. I can give you more if you want, or this is going to be enough. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I, I very much appreciate it. I got several messages asking if you do office visits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can arrange that. No problem. <laughs> so we will make follow up. Okay. We're not allowed to fly right now, so. Yes. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye bye. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Xander, ready? Yes. Um, let's see if I can find my presentations quickly. There. Um, so while I'm starting my presentation, um, I would like to have the first question on the screen. Is that possible? Yeah. So what I'd like you to think about first is, is this Corona crisis that we currently face mostly a health or an economic crisis? Okay, so now I'm curious. It's mostly a health crisis. That's what I hoped you would say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh, let's start this presentation and I'll, I'll show you how economists would go about this question. And, um, and hopefully I'll, I'll give you some insight in the way we think about uh, crises like these. Uh, so I'm a health economist, which means that I've got a background in both epidemiology and economics. Um, can see my presentation there. Right. Like I need to get this one smaller there. Yeah. So health economics is about health and economics. And you, you're probably not surprised. Uh, and, and, and much of what we do is aimed at supporting policy making. And that is quite an important addition because um, in, in, in many instances, when we try to support policy making, we don't have all the evidence at the highest level of the hierarchy of evidence. So what we typically do is we try to make do with what we have. We typically work with varying degrees of quality of evidence uh, in our work. Uh, and that might explain some of what we, what we suggest and what we say. Um, now looking at what we do, if when we, when we try and advise in health economics, is we, we typically take a perspective from society. So what we're trying to do is maximize welfare, both in terms of health and in terms of economics. Um, and in that respect, we are, for example, very, very different from people with a background in business administration. And as it happens in the Dutch language, an economist is sometimes an economist like I am, like working from societal, a societal perspective, trying to maximize welfare. And in, 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 the, in the Netherlands, we would also say bedrijfsteken, our business economist. So, um, our business administration, and we would refer to such a person as an economist as well, which is very, very, very different from the English language uh, use of economics. So I wanna stress that health economists are taking a societal perspective. And sometimes that means that we lean towards health, sometimes we lean towards economics, and hopefully both contribute to a higher level of social welfare. Um, now, if you look at um, the research that we do, 
Uh, you see people answering questions like, is the cure worse than the disease? And another paper is that's on that is trading off consumption and, and COVID nineteen deaths. That's that, that's a pretty terrible title, I think. Uh, and you wouldn't you need you need not worry about uh, such research because uh, typically our delay between finishing a work and getting it published in economics and health economics is a year and a half. So by the time this virus is long gone, we're going to see these publications being peer reviewed and published. Um, so first of all, if I want to look at, at, at health costs and, and look at the trade-off or look at the magnitude, I want to think about the, uh, the maximum range of health costs. So let's say, what would happen if we, weren't, if we were to allow the virus to roam free? And I'm thinking, like, I'm using an infection fatality uh, rate of about 1%. I'm using a herd, using herd immunity rate of 60%. You could argue it's lower. You could argue it's higher with some overshoot. Um, I'm, I'm using something like an average life expectancy lost of a patient who died from COVID based on work by Handlon of 12 years. I, I personally believe that's a little bit of an overestimation. There has been some discussion amongst economists what is this appropriate figure. We're going to see some more research in the future but so for now bear with me this is going to be like a, a, a maximum um, those years aren't going to be lived in full quality of life so we think that if we take those 12 years um, we model that about nine qualities will go lost for each person on average who dies of covid if we continue um, working our way through uh, in the Netherlands, assuming 17.3 million people have a 1% chance, chance of dying if they get the disease and about 60% of the people will eventually get the disease before we reach herd immunity. And each of those will lose about nine qualities. We are looking at about a million qualities lost as a consequence of this, this pandemic. And uh, if you look at it from a slightly different perspective, you could also look at the loss of life expectancy. So looking at the current generation, the people who are living in the Netherlands, if this virus were to roam free, how much life expectancy would go lost? And it's important to realize that we're kind of assuming that once we reach herd immunity and we, we enter this endemic phase, that uh, we don't really assume a lot of life lost afterwards. Could be because of uh, vaccines, could be because of other reasons, but it's a one-time loss. And if you assume a one-time loss, then this COVID will lead to a loss of life expectancy of about one month. And you could say one month, that's not a whole lot, or is it? Well, if you compare this to say, for example, we, would, we were to get the, to find a cure of all cancer and cancer would be, we would cure, we would get rid of all cancer, then we would probably see our life expectancy increasing by about two, and sometimes it's estimated three years. So it's a very, very different disease than COVID is in terms of what it does to our life expectancy. Now, if we were to compute, and that's that's where economists come in and they say, well, let's say well, we have to make a trade. Sometimes you do, and it's terrible if you think about it. But sometimes as a society, we need to make this decision about are we going to spend our money to try and to do the utmost to save this last life? Um, how, how much are we willing to spend? How much are we willing to sacrifice in terms of, say, purchasing power, in terms of uh, education, in terms of defense, in terms of social welfare? What are we willing to sacrifice to try and save this last life or this last quality, quality adjusted life here? And uh, it's been estimated for this, this particular disease based on the people who it, who it affects to have been about 40,000 euros per quality, quality adjusted life year lost. That is actually a similar figure to what we observe in Belgium. If we were to multiply the two, we would end up with something like a total maximum damage to the welfare of society valued in euros at 37 billion euros. It's quite, a, it's, it's a very dramatic, it's a, it's a very big figure. And of course, it reflects the tremendous damage, health damage and the terrible consequences of this disease to the people who get infected and some of them die or other people who have long-term 
consequences of the disease. I'm actually assuming that most of the consequences will be in death, as you, as you see from this computation. Now, if I were to change shift gear and look at the economics, at the economic costs to the, uh, to the economy, you can, you can look at it um, by focusing on public health costs or health care costs or productivity loss. And in fact, that's, that's how health economists would typically look at any intervention, any disease, if we do a cost effectiveness analysis. But the trouble with this disease, is, is, is it, this uh, virus, is that it actually does much, much more damage to the society than simply the loss and productivity of the people who usually work and are now infected and can't work. So it's, it's other factors that are much more important and health economists have struggled with this in the beginning. And to give you an example, and I'm sorry for the Dutch, I'll translate. Uh, we're looking at a scenario computed by a Dutch agency who does, who does economic forecasts for the government, the CPB. And as you can see in this graph, on the horizontal axis is the, is the, uh, it's, it's the years. And you can see there's a dotted line. The dotted line reflects the, uh, the, what we had expected without any pandemic. So we expected a small growth. And then as a, as a consequence of the first wave, you see this light blue and thick line. And it was a, it was a very damaging um, uh, wave to the economy. And you can see this dark blue line, which is a, the second wave scenario. And it's actually assuming that there's going to be more waves then, that we're not going to be able to contain the virus. And it perhaps reflects the situation we're currently in. Now, if you see, if you look at this, you can see that this second wave is about hitting the economy at 10%. And 10% is about 85 mil, billion euros a year. And if you look at it carefully too, you see that the lines aren't directly converging. So this, we're not looking at a one time of one year uh, consequence. This might actually, in the best scenarios that I've seen so far, assume that we're never quite gonna, come, gonna be able to compensate the loss that we, uh, we are currently experiencing as a consequence of the disease. Now, therefore, looking at the economic crisis, I would say that all, the healthcare cost, the public health cost, and the productivity loss directly related to the people that are sick are almost irrelevant with respect to the, to the, the damage that the economy is suffering from this, from this disease. And we're looking at 2020, on, after 2020 only, we're looking at a margin between 28 and 108 billion euros of economic damage, which means that if we compare the two, you can see that the maximum range of healthcare of health losses is indeed much lower, even if I'm computing, like I'm taking assumptions that would lead to relatively high estimates. And still, I would end up with a, a range of, of health losses that are much, much smaller than the economic losses. And I think that this also um, um, is a, like, so in economic terms, we would say the damages to the society and, and in our terms, the welfare of society. So you could say the happiness of all people in society uh, evaluated typically in euros, we would then say the majority of the damage is probably being caused by the economy and not so much the health losses. If, and that's not to say that those aren't major, right? The, I mean, the figure uh, indicates that they are major, uh, but we would say that uh, the consequences is, aren't, aren't, aren't just for lives, they're also for livelihoods. And those consequences, they, they may end up being more major. Now, some, some might say, some have said in the beginning, could we then argue that the cure, the cure of like, trying to do something about to, to trying to reduce the health damages, that those cures are worse than a disease. And looking at it from a societal level, so let's say there was this hypothetical option that we could somehow have this disease, this, this, this virus infection coming, going right through the economy, right through the society without people adjusting their lives whatsoever. If that's the case, if we could somehow allow that or force that to happen from a, from a perspective, looking at it from, from the top, you might say, yes, this cure 
is worse than a disease. But in practice, it's not something that we can decide. That's not the society that we've got. It's not like that we can force people who are in the high risk groups to not change their behavior. At the individual level, people make decisions on how to respond to the virus. And this depends on their own cost and benefit analysis. So they make an individual choice based on the risks that they face. But in my case, personally, I don't really think I'm in the high risk group. I certainly hope not. Uh, and I just want to make sure that the people that I care about who are in the high risk groups are not going to be infected. And so people make decisions individually based on their, uh, their, their uh, assessment of costs and benefits of, of their behavior. And so what matters most? Well, I would say there is no such a, there's no way to just force people to, to, to ignore the disease. And so ultimately it matters what the individual does and how he or she responds to the disease. And we can look at it. I think this graph is, is one of the strongest graphs uh, to, to, uh, to, to point that out. In this graph, I've got two neighboring states in the United States. One of them is South Dakota and the other one's Minnesota. Now in Minnesota, there was is one of the, the majority of states that introduced a lockdown, whereas South Dakota didn't. Both have similar levels of viral um, in infections and infection rates in the, in the, in the state. And, uh, but the people in South Dakota were allowed to, to go about their daily business, whereas the people in Minnesota had all sorts of constraints. And now you can see on this graph, you can see how the total spending by all consumers decreased. That's on the vertical axis. And it's, it's reflected and, and on the horizontal axis, you find the days. As you can see, when the virus hit both states, people responded quite similarly. And it wasn't because of the formal uh, um, restrictions. It was clearly because of individual choices that people made to not, not uh, put themselves or other people at risk. And we can also look at this in Australia. I like this. Uh, I, I like the Australian example a lot because we've seen two spikes in, in, the, in, in, the, in the rate of uh, infections, one in April, Mar uh, end of March, beginning of April, and one in the summer. And as you can see, uh, so that's the blue line on the left top. If you can go down from it, you can see how that affected consumer confidence levels. And you can see those confidence levels have dropped really dramatically right at the point where the infection rates went up. On the right hand side, you can see that this is this graph when the uh, uh, expenditure, the weekly consumption per person dropped rather dramatically as the infection rates went up. Then there was this economic stimulus package that started before, before the end of uh, uh, March. And people didn't really respond to it. People started saving money rather than spending it. And the economy was really lying on its back. Then by May, we saw that uh, the, uh, the, the government was able to control the virus. People started um, gaining confidence levels, as you can see in the left graph on the bottom. And all of a sudden, people started spending their money again. And the eco economy veered back. Now that's not just true for the for uh, Australia. You can see that there is this on the left hand side. There's a table that shows the correlation between the number of new cases per capita and the daily consumer confidence within the country. And I have to say, I've, I I don't typically see correlations this strong in economics. So this, these are very very strong uh, correlations where people really responded very very deeply. Um, um, to the increasing numbers of cases per capita. And, and that's just, that's the consumer side of things. So consumer confidence is really affected, but on the producer side, the producers now states, and this is the second wave, that companies fear the drop in demand for their products and services the most, which is to say that consu consumer confidence, as, as it really affects the, the, the willingness to go about and spend their money and take risks is affecting the demand on the demand side of the economy and therefore producers, uh, as, a, as a consequence, are very, very afraid of the second wave and might uh, and expect uh, a large drop in their 
expenditure and economic growth. So I would argue that it's not up to the society. It's not up to the, go the government to really try and force uh, the society to behave in a particular fashion. And if the government tries to, it will fail. It's the individual level is people have the opportunity to adjust their behavior. And it's that's the address. That's where we need to focus our policy on. And currently, I think there is a good, it's good level of evidence that the economy, um, the economic recovery does require controlling the virus. Mind you, I'm not saying get rid of the virus altogether. I'm saying controlling the virus. People want to have confidence that the government and that the, the, the measures that the government takes uh, enable the government to control the virus to the level where they then start, um, like when then, then their econo uh, consumer confidence uh, rebounds. And it's interesting, to, it's interestingly enough, during this summer, that didn't happen in the Netherlands. So apparently people didn't trust the government to have full control over the virus, even though the levels of uh, viral spread were pretty low in the Netherlands during the uh, summer months, especially June and July. Thank you. That was um, what I wanted to share with you. I'm sorry. Um... Thank you very much, um, Sander. Um, yes, uh, I think I have picked up one, an interesting question from the chat, and that was about your estimates for the health uh, impact whether or not you included potential delayed care uh, impact in ah. the estimates and what yes. that do. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and to be honest, um, that, that we have quite, there is a bit of evidence uh, when um, um, in the past, when we looked at doctor strikes, for example, sometimes like prolonging doctor strikes for months, where doctors would, uh, physicians would uh, uh, would have Sunday services. That is to say, they would do all acute care, uh, but try and postpone all elective care as much as possible. And um, there's been a number of studies into the consequence, health consequences of such uh, policies. And the best evidence that we've got is that those are minor. I have to say, it, there is uh, there is much to, to be improved in terms of this field of research. And in fact, we are starting up uh, quite a bit of work in this field uh, to, to try and figure out um, if this actually applies. So in short, I think if there's a short delay and it's especially, uh, uh, especially affects um, uh, elective care and it's just a delay of a couple of months, I think that the damage is can be assumed to be rather limited. Now, I think the current wave might actually not take a couple of months, it might take more. And uh, in that case, we really don't know. And it's, it, it, it could be quite severe. Okay. Um, so, well, I, let me invite the other uh, speakers to the panel. Um, just, and, and put on your videos. I guess we are almost complete already. So I'm just gonna continue. Um, so I think there's a first set of questions that I would like to address to the combination of Xanda and Thijs. Um, because, um, um, well, uh, Thijs did a, a sort of a, a plea for including thinking about value of biodiversity, wildlife into our, well, I might say economical thinking. Are there ways of doing that? Are there models of doing that? Uh, what, you know, what is, what is the thinking? Uh, Xander and Thijs, both, both of you, I'm interested to hear your views. Yeah, maybe, maybe I um, give a, an example that I, that I found very uh, interesting um, from, the, from the, uh, somebody working in nature conservation. Um, to maybe and, and ask how you how you think about this. I'm really interested to know how you think about this. So this person um, uh, wrote that um, there is a risk of um, monetizing everything in life. So it's a little bit philosophical. There's a risk of monetizing everything in life. Um, and with regards to nature conservation, um, some uh, nature conservation people have gone that route 
and they've, they've then taken, let's say, a forest, and they say, well, um, the value of this forest to human society is um, uh, X uh, million dollars. And, and they're based it on, on, on uh, objective measures uh, and, and the kind of things that, that you've been indicating. You know, you just ask somebody, what do you think about this forest? How much is it worth to you? What would you um, uh, not do to be able to have this forest? And, and you give it some kind of a, um, a monetary value. And then somebody finds um, a gold mine underneath the forest. And they say, okay, well, clear. Uh, this gold mine is worth more. So cut down the forest. So here um, there's these, this whole group of nature conservation people who are fighting all their lives and, and trying to convince the rest of human society um, you know, how valuable nature is including um, this forest, then they, they, they um, take this, this scary route of, of monetizing um, the value of nature, and this is what happens. How do you think about that? And I think we can, this, this extends into this question about um, the value of biodiversity versus um, economic uh, um, uh, prosper or economic growth. Um, in, of, of, of countries, developing countries especially. Let me first I'm say very that. interested to see how you, yeah. th how you think about that. I think this is a fantastic question. I, 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 I feel like I could, we could discuss this for the next half hour and I'll try, <laughs> I'll try to be brief. This is uh, like not having drinks and not having a face to face. Yeah, really <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so so um, I think that the, the, like the formal answer and that has to be uh, the, the way to look at this is that economics uh, is a consequentialist way of looking at. So we are looking at this from a consequentialist perspective where we value things only... For, for me and for other people, what is a consequentialist? All right. Um, well, a consequentialist is someone who looks at the, the consequences of, of, of behavior. So it's not about the uh, behavior of uh, whether the behavior in itself is right um, or that the principles that you apply when, when thinking about behavior are right or wrong. It's, it's about looking at the consequences of behavior. So the behavior itself, you might, you might argue is disrespectful or you might dislike it, uh, but then economists would just then say, well, we don't really care, we look at the consequences. And when I say we don't really care, I mean to say what we present to the audience and to the public is, is an evaluation of the consequences. And we value using um, how people might, it's always from the perspective of the people, from people who are willing to pay or willing to sacrifice, it's, I think it's a better measure, to sacrifice other goods in order to have this, this forest. Now, obviously, why would you, why would the value of the earth not have any intrinsic value? If there were no people, would it have no value? Well, according to this, this like simple way of looking at, at the world of, of economists, it would have no value if there are no people. Uh, and clearly there is more of the ethics than this consequentialist perspective where we just value according to how people evaluate things. So I think there is no economist who would deny this. We would just say, we're going to give you a perspective. It's going to matter in decision-making, but hopefully this is not the only thing you're going to consider. And it's up to politicians to trade off all of these ethical perspectives that you could have when looking at this forest. Maybe a follow-up question. Sorry, Thijs, I know you would love to go, <laughs> but okay. I think you have to follow up there. Sure, definitely. Um, yeah. I think there's a Thank you, Sander. Yeah. well for me related question yeah. uh, but and that is stemming from what uh, Bart presented where uh, um, there is this challenge of well the, the, it's been clear that that there have been warnings about the disease that we're now looking at coming up the knowledge was there the potential to develop vaccines was there, um, the thinking about maybe animal vaccination is an option. But again, there, there seems to be a total disconnect between getting that on the agenda as really a, a wise thing to do and to put a lot of money on the table for, uh, 
rather than waiting until things happen. So, and to me, it's intriguing how different, how, how has the water world succeeded in doing this? And is the health world just not getting there? Um, what would you recommend? What would Bart recommend? recommend? What would... Well. Yeah, but apparently you would need a disaster like this to get this going. Apparently everything that happened, like the SARS-1 epidemic, was too much, too, too, too quick controlled to really that it <clears throat> to everyone was clear that someone, uh, something needs to happen, and especially in terms of preparedness. And uh, the question now is how will this develop in, in the future and how quickly we will forget about this and move on. So I'm quite curious. And the question indeed is what is, what would be the, 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 the value there to, 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 to weigh that from an economic perspective? So uh, that would be interesting. So how much are you willing to put in to, to be better prepared? It's the, 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 the question about what can prevention cost? This is a dilemma for all prevention, uh, I think, and particularly when it's an unknown distant risk that you may or may not come across. Of course, it's a very difficult uh, item to put on the agenda. Can I respond? Sure. Oh, please. Uh, like, um, I, I think the politicians are usually in there for the short run and uh, the, 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 the time horizon of a politician is usually not, not, not the, uh, um, like not stretching more than four or five years. And, and there's a probability that an, a new virus, a new pandemic might happen, but probably not in the next phase. And it's difficult to, for them to try and, try and, 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 and make investments now, which would take away money from, from, from uh, other goals that they might have for something that, that's probably not going to happen in their, uh, in their ruling time. Now, the trouble is, what I, what's, what's, struggling, what's, what's troubling me is that our prime minister pretty much yesterday or the day before said uh, that in the summertime, when just, we just had the first wave and he said in the summertime, well, I thought it was over. And I thought, I mean, Okay, if he if he doesn't if he can't see the second wave coming, and if he doesn't trust his like advisors, who who pro probably all said there's going to be a second wave, I don't think there wasn't anyone who was anyone who said it was over. And then if he doesn't trust those people, how is he ever going to set aside serious amounts, serious funds for for us to prepare for second for future pandemics? And to be honest with you, I haven't got an answer. So maybe it's that's a question for Marijn. Because it's been, uh, I found that striking also in the, the questions from the general public, but also I have been presenting in the hospital with all the clinical staff in June when it was almost like a party that, okay, we did this. And I said, beware, there is going to be a second wave. And it's very difficult to get across. So Marijn, help us. How should we do this? Well, I, I, I'm not sure that there was a, 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 the same message then from all the experts, because I've heard some experts say, there's no guarantee there will be a second wave and the virus might in the heat of the summer might not really spread that much, etc. cetera. So, so from my point of view, with sort of uh, releasing uh, uh, much of the policies and, uh, and the summertime coming up, um, um, and uh, and that there wasn't really a, a sort of a, yeah a, a clear message that you know a second wave is very realistic and uh, and uh, and we're just you know it's about the degree to which we adhere and if we don't do it it will come back I I didn't hear that uh, that, that message so I think that you know you don't know you will evaluate later etc but. Uh, um, so if, if we take the bigger picture and say, how do we prepare for something that, that is you know, very infrequent or very unlikely? I think in the case of this pandemic, um, um, of course, there's a very concrete example now of what it might do to, to our country. And I think there will be a, a, you know, a lot of research and evidence on the economic impact, the impact on well-being, and uh, there might be a long recovery time. So you know, this, this maybe presents also an opportunity 
for getting those things on the table and uh, and 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 getting better and better in uh, in future uh, policies. Um, you know, I, that's also how I see it a little bit for the behavioral science side of things. So we weren't in this crisis structure eh, at the beginning, um, but that it's not just here that we're not, you know, uh, initially around the table. So I, I work a lot in hospitals and medical care, and uh, and there uh, behavior is key to a lot of the, the the surgeries that are being done, recovery from surgery. A lot of people who come in in healthcare come there because of an unhealthy lifestyle. But I don't know the exact percentages, maybe Xander knows, but I would say that 95% of the investment is made in biomedical care, while I would say that at least half of the issues that we're seeing are behavioral. So, so it, it's also there that, uh, that, uh, that there's this imbalance of what causes the problems and what drives the solution and, uh, and the, uh, the investment. So I think from my discipline... But then, but yeah, then but then you say, I know how to influence the behavior. Yes. And is that really true? Yeah. 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 I mean, so of course, you need to do research for that. But if you look at uh, looking at making people stop smoking, me making people eating too much. Uh, yeah. 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 No, I mean, we've done meta regression analysis in which we uh, are able to associate what we call the active ingredients of behavior change interventions with outcomes, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in HIV, but also in smoking cessation. And we see that we explain about uh, uh, 20 to 40 percentage points in, uh, in outcomes. Uh, so uh, between the experimental and comparator. So um, now I think there's, there's quite good evidence on what might help. Uh, but it's often not that easy because you, you don't only communicate with the individual, you actually want to see if you can activate groups, communities, change the environment. Eh? Um, um, uh, so so these, these interventions can be more complicated than, uh, than just giving somebody a pill or a vaccination. Yeah. So I would like another follow up maybe. Um, so for instance, right now, um, that's a dilemma that I see uh we could advocate more so the the and that this is about striking the balance between uh our al alarmist i mean we hear of people getting very nervous uh depressed etc uh yet needing to advocate that we need more permanent attention for these problems we have seen really the first true evidence of establishment of West Nile virus in our backyard. It's here, we will have problems, outbreaks in the coming years. It was a conscious effort to not make that too big a media deal because of the situation, but it's there, it happened. As of this week, we have, uh, Thijs is working on bird flu outbreaks that may or may not enter the farming environment. We're just not making it too big of a deal but that again, the first thing is, uh, is that a, a, a zoonotic one. Um, so it's, it's there all the time, yet we don't manage to get that across and because we're also tr trying to strike a balance between being alarmist versus you know, getting it on the agenda. So what is a good advice there? I see Xander also has a, Something yeah. I, I like these discussions a lot. So I'm, if I'm uh, if I'm answering too many questions, then please uh, interfere. But um, uh, I think looking at the European Recovery Fund, we're looking at a trillion euros, right? It's 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 incredible money. If you think about it, uh, we've never seen anything like this other than the Marshall Plan, perhaps. Um, now I think it, it also makes sense to economists that if we're able to try, if we're able to prevent future outbreaks, then that is worth a lot of money. So without like working, like communicating towards the individual public and getting people to be very anxious all the time about possible disasters in the near future, uh, we could just take the route of the economists, right? If they, they're looking at a trillion dollars investment now, they're certainly willing to try and prevent another, something like this to happen in the near future. So part of this, this deal at, in Europe needs to be that we, control like we, we get to a policy a european pan pan european country of a policy where we uh, stimulate each country to try and, and set up an effective structure to prevent future outbreaks like this 
because we all suffer if they don't. Okay, yeah, so we're gonna hire you to help us write the narrative there, right? <laughs> okay, so a question for Quirin. Um, so following up on the data discussion, and it's, uh, I'm sorry that uh, it's too bad that Aura had to leave, but um, we also heard, uh, so this has also been uh, a big discussion, not only nationally, but also internationally. But we've also heard in the talk that Bach gave that people have actually suffered from being transparent with data. So. The scientist that first mentioned SARS, the scientist that first mentioned MERS, and probably the scientists that first mentioned SARS-CoV-2 were fired. The scientists that first mentioned in that there was something going wrong with the dengue trials in the Philippines were put in jail. So it's easy for us to say, share, immediately, open, transparent, There's, there is, issues at stake. Um, so um, how, and, and I know you are of the open science movement. I, uh, I heard Xander say, uh, you don't have to worry about the literature on, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pro versus con literature because, because for that is out, will be long time down the, the road, but that's not really the case because we see preprint papers all the time that, that bring these theories into the debate. So what do you think? Is there a middle ground of open data and open science or should it remain everything open or should we have a safe space for outbreak related collaborative science? Yeah, I think that this is a huge question. Um, so let me, I'm going to narrow down a little bit, if you allow me, uh, just looking at the Netherlands and looking at outbreak situations. And the way I think about it is because we are mostly publicly funded and because lots of the data that is being collected is data representing the people of the Netherlands, I think there must be a, a better way of optimizing public good. I think that should be the first question we're asking and how should we do that? And the problem is there is a, uh, there's always a, a sort of a, um, um, I think the academic structure is not made for public health impact. I can even say that as an epidemiologist, uh, we're being our, our, our fuel is papers rather than public health impact. So I think those are those are the things where we have to, to think about how do we optimize public good by making data available to scientists, by making scientists available to the public or to the public good without them having to hide their data, hide their results, keep their results to themselves until they are sure they're they can publish it in science. Um, I think that's that's where the, the real uh, challenges lie. Uh, thanks, Rinza. I will take a bit over from uh, Marion. So actually a very big question, even though we're over time now, is the future for the Netherlands Center for One Health. And yesterday we had a discussion uh, within the board, uh, do we focus more on the biological, anthropocentric, uh, uh, one health approach, or are we going to be a bit more diverse, uh, have biodiversity more important, uh, having also social sciences included. So uh, I would like to ask Thijs, maybe you first, uh, being part of NCOH for quite a while, what do you think, also particularly looking at your talk of today? So I think uh, that um, we need to look at this in a larger perspective. And we need to involve more um, disciplines in our work. Um, a lot of the problems that we're seeing, we actually know um, we have sufficient knowledge um, to be able to take measures to be able to prevent them in the future. And what we are lacking, at least the, the let's say, uh, um, the, the biologists, medical people, veterinarians, virologists. What we're lacking is, is the knowledge of how humans work 
to be able to implement those changes. So I am very much in favor of including um, more um, of the uh, scientists who understand how humans work um, yeah. behaviorally Good. and how they, yeah. um, how the society works um, as a group of people to um, make changes to address things like um, pandemic prevention but also the bigger problems like uh, climate change and biodiversity loss. I think they're part of the same issue, actually. It's one big issue where in which pandemic um, emergence is just a symptom. So uh, Marijn, do you agree with this? Do you think you should be part of the NCOH? I, I think if you look at all these societal issues um, uh, that you really need this multidisciplinary approach and uh, um, so I, I guess that's your question or not. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so, uh, I mean, you, you see it now. And it, I, what I always try to do is sort of try and map the causal model from, you know, from something to, to an outbreak, for example. And then you see, you know, you have the, 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 the biology in there, you have the physiology, you've got the behavior in there, you've got at community level, you've got the economy in there. So, so I, I, I think we need to go very much towards an integrated science um, uh, where we sort of equally uh, uh, value the different disciplines and, and integrate them in, the, in analyzing the problem and presenting solutions. And I think there can be quite a lot of missed opportunities when we just focus on one area uh, where you actually also have intervention opportunities in the others. So yeah, I think uh, all these things that, that this society is about could, yeah, does already benefit, I guess, from this multidisciplinary approach. It is important though to think about this in terms of the, the, like the PhD students, there will be quite a few of them listening to this conversation. Uh, it's not so easy in the current uh, academic system. Everyone needs to finalize their PhD, right? People need to get their thesis. So it's, I think it's easier said than done. We, we have the One Health Pact project, which has a group of 26 PhD students, and we need to discuss how, you know, how does multidisciplinary science work? How does everyone still get their, you know, their piece of the pudding that they need to, to, for their career track? I think that, uh, I think this, this is the future. I mean, there's no future for being in your, in your little cocoon um, and, uh, and, uh, and I think there's many universities like uh, also in Wageningen that has a very, you know, uh, historically a very multidisciplinary uh, angle, um, you know, with, uh, um, uh, with the sociology and communication science departments related to agricultural innovations and education, etc. cetera. Um, so, so, and also in medical, I mean, I haven't supervised one PhD student that I didn't supervise together with a medical specialist. So, so um, you just need to find the right people, uh, I think, and then, uh, then everything uh, is fine. Yeah. Where there's a will, there's a way. So maybe yeah. Mar Marjan, for you to conclude, uh, I think also the engagement with the society because uh, we have 70 million virologists, so there are many of you around. And uh, so citizen science and NCOH, what's your take on that? And then I would like also you to close the meeting so that we get your take on that. Well, yes, I think it's it's an integral part, and we are really also exploring that now. Um, and uh, so, part of the also looking at um, the the oh, I need to look at the chat because someone says doesn't agree with me. Uh, Gijs Klaus says my PhD is a combination of uh, epidemiology, spatial analysis, public health and statistics. You should always look broader than your own field. I fully agree. I fully agree. So there's that. Um, so yes, I do, do think citizen science is a crucial element um, and to be explore, explored much further. We see quite nice examples, but there's also examples evolving where citizens patients decide whether or not they want to be part of a cohort. So right now we have clinicians saying, I have this cohort study uh, and uh, you, you work with the clinicians and make agreements and then they may or may not uh, include patients in the cohort. 
But there's also now citizens that say, no, that's not for you to decide, it's for me to decide. Those are interesting models that we will see evolve, I think, in, in the near future. So, um, and you wanted me to um, close? Yes, sir. You yeah. want to wrap, wrap up? Yep. It's too bad we don't have drinks as, because we could go on for another uh, hour here, at least, I would say. But um, uh, yes, it, it's, it, it's been a wonderful afternoon. Um, I would like to very much thank all the speakers and uh, particularly also the people that uh, organized this afternoon who are not showing their faces, uh, uh, Maike uh, and Maarten. Yes. The we should not forget Rebecca and the drawing just to... Yes, Sorry. yes, I know. Yeah, and, and the whole communication team. Huh? There's also, there's just too many to mention, but the whole yes, communication team. and the whole communication team. And we really now need to draw your attention to that green uh, slide that you have been seeing. And that really is the summary of our whole afternoon. And that you will receive also as a as a summary uh, and a memory of this uh, discussion. I do think you got my hairdo uh, right, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it'll uh, it'll be interesting to uh, to look at this uh, summary and conclusion. So we will be making a bit a, a, a short report or summary of this whole uh, meeting, and we will also make sure that um, the, 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 the video can be uh, uh, looked at by anyone who is interested in, in uh, having a closer look at our discussions. So with that, thank you very much. Marion, can you mention that the next webinar oh. will be 19 uh, November and the topic will be AMR. It's part of the AMR Awareness Week. So if you want to stay updated, sign up on our newsletter on the NCOH website. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> and also look at the website for all other activities that we are planning. So thanks again and um, have a nice uh, evening, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.